Welcome back to episode 138 of the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast. My name is Josh. I'm here at Troy. It's a snowy Sunday evening here in Minnesota. What's going on, buddy? Not a whole lot snowing, and I always love it when we get our first substantial snowfall because people forget how to drive. It's always fun. And I was driving yesterday by the ski resort in town, Buck Hill, which is really just a hill. It's not a big mountain or anything. And they were making snow. And, of course, when they make snow, it freezes on the freeway. They have these big flashing warning signs. And there was one lane open because there was a huge wreck. And two cars just demolished. I'm like, how does this place not get sued? I mean, is it just because they have the flashing sign that says, hey, slow down. But no one does because we're in Minnesota. And I guess we forget how to drive when it snows. Yeah, let's create black ice on the highway. Right on <laughs> highway. It's not just highway. It's the interstate. Yeah, and, yeah, 35. Yeah. Yeah. All the way down to Dallas, right? Something like yeah. that. Or the Mexican border. So yeah, that is a <laughs> crazy. And it is it is the the aforementioned Buck Hill is appropriately named. It is definitively a hill. It's <laughs> it certainly not a, a mountain. <laughs> all right, man. Well, like I said, it's snowing. It's good to be warm and inside. Excited to talk hockey cards. <laughs> it's but not midnight. We we're, that, not, we're, we're not recording not midnight. midnight. Yeah, it's actually 4.51 p.m. It feels weird <laughs> to be doing this at a normal time. Before we get started, though, just a reminder that our show, Troy, is called the Hockey Cards Gong Show Podcast, in case you forgot. And, uh, well, we need people's support. And it's very easy to support us by a Patreon. You can join our on a $199 support level tier. It's $5 a month. And uh, that really helps us cover our show expenses, continue to produce more, and hopefully, well, better hockey card content and help fund initiatives, even in a small way to grow the hockey card hobby. Super easy to do. Uh, you can just go to our website, which is hockeycardsgongshow.com, and click on the button at the top of the page that says become a patron. Or you can go to the Patreon website directly, P A T R E O N.com, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. How many people do you think we've taught to spell Patreon on the show so far? That's a good question. I didn't know how to spell it when we first started doing it. So it's a lot, I bet. But it's like, I I bet I'll be be laying in the hospital going, P A T R. (laughs) Like, I crack up you say that because I I still can't say any word or any names, but I'm getting really good at spelling some of the harder ones because you spell them enough times and I'll remember it, but I still can't say them. And if you don't want to go to the Patreon website, there's a link in the show description if you're listening to us on a podcast app or in the YouTube description. And then finally, in our Instagram and TikTok profiles, there's a link in our link tree there. Not only do you support us, you can also get access to our Discord server where you can chat with us every day and the crew that's already there, uh, 150, 160, some people now, something like that. So a lot of fun there. All right, Troy, let's get into it. Ready for the game plan? On today's show, we begin with the almost greatest NHL player to wear, number 38. Then it's off to Who's Hot and the Struggle Bus. This is followed by hobby news and new product releases. We then tackle another edition of the Gong Show Mailbag. We end the show, as always, with personal pickups. All right, Josh, we are on episode 138. So previously, we looked at the greatest NHL player that wore the number that matched our episode number. We ran through all those numbers. So now we are looking at the almost greatest NHL player to wear each number from the runners up list in the hockey writers greatest nhl player to wear each number article okay josh the almost greatest nhl player to wear number 38 per the nominees in the hockey writers greatest nhl player to wear each number article and selected by me is vladimir malakoff there he is josh this is the best picture i could find besides a couple more that i use later but there it is <laughs> there he is good old vlad kind of a chachi pose there and yeah, i'm gonna looks- choose to line today with people that have never heard of Vladimir <laughs> Malakov because I certainly never have. Is yeah. that bad? I don't think so. I mean, he he played – he was a good player for – he was a good D-man. He had some issues, we'll okay. just say. He's he's more known right. – I get into this later. I'll, I'll, I, won't, I won't ruin it, but we'll uh, we'll get into it. So, okay. okay. All right. So that was our almost greatest at 38 is Vladimir Malakov. The other nominee at number 38 was Dave – Sketchard or Sketchard. Don't ask me. Don't know who that is either. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know who that was. And as a reminder, the greatest to wear number 38, always in our hearts, Pavel Demetria, former wild. If everyone yeah. remembers, died in a tragic plane crash. 
with in the KHL league, I believe over in Russia, the whole team, I think besides one trainer maybe survived or something. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. All right. So Malakoff defenseman from, I don't know why I do this. S V E R D L O V S K Soviet union. So I'm going to go Ferdlovsk. <laughs> Ferdlovsk. I have no idea. Somewhere in Ferdlovsk. the Soviet union. Yeah, it's a little, little crazy name there. All those concepts. Okay, so, so this is one of those. Do you think if we each got... Okay, let, let me think here. <laughs> if we got 50 attempts each at pronunciation, what are the odds <laughs> that one of the 50 would be right? I'm guessing. Yeah, it, it got it zero. right. Just by mistake, we'd actually get it right. All right. Malakoff was selected 191st overall in the 1989 NHL entry draft by the New York Islanders. Malakoff played in 712 regular season NHL games over a 13 season NHL career. Malakoff, Josh, played for five different teams during the course of his NHL career. He started out with the New York Islanders, then he played for Montreal. Next, he had a short stint with the Devils before playing for the New York Rangers. At the end of his career, he played very briefly. For Philadelphia, and then had another stint with the Devils. So well-traveled man in his 13-year career. For his awards and accomplishments, he's a one-time Stanley Cup winner. He was named to the 1992-93 All-Rookie Team. And Josh, here's your favorite. Yes, he is a triple gold club member. He won a Stanley Cup in 2000 with the Devils, a gold medal at the 1992 Winter Games with the Unified Team, our favorite, the unified team. And he won a gold medal at the 1990 World Championships with the Soviet Union. For the course... Because a gold yeah. medal in the Winter <laughs> yeah. Olympics. A gold medal. in the You got a gold meal in your notes. so Nice. Uh, That's cool. But I assume you mean medal. Gold medal in the World Championships and a silver Stanley Cup. Somehow. <laughs> Two out of three. Equals triple gold. Two out of three, amen. So it goes gold. All right, for his career, regular season stats, 86 goals, 260 assists for 346 points. Malakoff made the playoff in six of his 13 NHL seasons, compiling eight goals, 19 assists for 27 points in 75 NHL playoff games played. All right, best season of his NHL career from a point standpoint was his 1993-94 season where Malakoff had 10 goals, 47 assists for 57 points in 76 games played with the New York Islanders, which I just conveniently put a picture of them with the Canadians. So good, good job by me. <laughs> Malakoff was a big defenseman standing at six foot four and weighing 227 pounds. As with most Russian prospects, he started off his career in the Russian league where he played for Moscow Spartak and CSKA Moscow before coming to the NHL at age 24. He actually started off as a pretty big star in the NHL, scoring 52 points in his first season and 57 points in his second season. During his career, he was known as a solid defenseman that had moments of offensive production. Where his career gets interesting, and this is what I alluded to earlier, is in fun facts, which we will get to very shortly. So what is Malakoff doing now? He is currently a player development coach for the New York Islanders. I don't know if this maybe is in the Russian mob. I mean, yeah, I like that picture. Looking yeah. good. It's from I think it's from his Wikipedia. Wait, All right, so, Russia, aren't Russian mob isn't that called the Bratva? Oh, I have no clue. I don't know. Get... Okay, I don't know. It might be. I have a. When I was in Russia, we actually met some Russian mob guys. They were really nice. They loved Americans when we were there. Did you play hockey there? I did. <laughs> All right, here we go. Fun, interesting facts. And this is straight from the bastion of truth that is Wikipedia. In 1999, Donald Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, was given a check for $350,000 from Malkoff to be given as a loan to his friend, Yulia Fomina, I guess. The friend, however, swore in an affidavit that she never received the money and never even knew the check had been written until it was discovered years later in a Florida lawsuit. So our boy somehow is tied to Trump and all the lawsuits. That just cracked me up. Maybe my Bratva thing was right. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Who knows what's going on there? During the 1999-2000 NHL season, Malakoff got in trouble with Canadians management after it was revealed that he went on a ski trip with his family during the All-Star break. Management was upset with Malakoff 
as he hadn't played with the team all season as he was recovering from a knee injury. As he was in breach of contract, Malakoff was suspended by the Canadians as a result. I think that makes sense. If you're not playing and you're recovering from a knee injury, I don't want to see that you went skiing. <laughs> no. Malakoff further angered Canadian fans and management by waving a. You seem to know a little bit about was... skiing and knee oh, yeah. injuries, don't you? Yeah, the uh, the old wife had the knee injury last year from skiing. All right, let me let me repeat. Malakoff further angered Canadian fans and management by waving obscene gestures at fans when he was loudly booed. When asked about it, Malakoff lashed out at the team's fans for his reaction. Malakoff was then traded to the New Jersey Devils weeks later. So I think they had enough of him in Montreal. And then our final fun fact, on December 19, 2005, reports surfaced that Malakoff, who joined the Devils for a second time, had unexpectedly retired from the NHL. However, shortly after the story broke, his agent claimed that Malakoff had not retired and was taking a leave of absence to deal with some internal, personal, and medical issue. This claim was disputed by Lou Lamarillo, Devils CEO, President, and General Manager, and Interim Head Coach at the time. Lamarillo rejected the request for a leave of absence and treated Malakoff's absence as a retirement. This marked the end of Malakoff's pro career. So that's how it ended. He just <laughs> disappeared and went off into the night. However, it didn't stop the Islanders from hiring. That's what I always find this interesting with all his like little fun stories that he's actually back in the NHL as a player development coach. So all that stuff must have been figured out and because it just seems a little odd, some of these stories. So at one time, Lou Lamarillo held the yeah. titles of CEO, president, general manager, and head coach. Yeah, that's at least that's what I put. It. And now, wow. who knows? My source might be wrong, but because I have all these inter like, internet sources, but that's what I got. Maybe it, okay. We'll see. Someone let us know. For his cards, and we know where this was going. His rookie card, Josh. I'm going. There's not much hobby love for our boy. He has a total of 18 cards ever graded at PSA and only four cards graded ever at BGS. But for his rookie card, I will go with his 1991-92 Upper Deck number 1 Soviet Stars. I didn't even know what these were. I was like, what is this gibber? I mean, I know it's Russian at the bottom of the card, but I believe it says Soviet Stars. PSA only has four graded copies of this card total, with all of them being PSA 8s. Obviously, I didn't find any sales. However, I did find a sale of his 1994 Pinnacle Rink Collection, hockey number 104, with the Islanders. It's a PSA 10 that sold for $7.50 US. So we are not going to have a lot of love, and I highly doubt we will ever talk about Malenkov again on the show. So did they airbrush the logo out of his jersey there, Troy? Or, <laughs> or is it, were they wearing like a blank? jersey i gotta believe it's airbrushed out right it just looks like it's there should be something there but it's gone missing i don't know why they had to do that or what legal issue it ran into or maybe that's what they were wearing when this picture was taken who knows but so this must be that russian stars card then yeah and it's definitely yeah it's the russian stars one and again it's just a weird just a weird picture <laughs> but it is what it is there you go all right, Troy. Good job. Yeah. Learned about another guy never heard of before. Probably <laughs> three weeks from now, I'll be like, who is that again? Because that's yep. how it seems to go like or go for us on the show. We're going to transition into who's hot in the struggle bus. We're already into week eight, of the NHL season, and almost 25% of the season's gone already, Troy. Wow. Where does the time go? I know. It's crazy. Well, we're back with another round of who's hot in the struggle bus, where we take a look at players currently dominating the NHL. Well, on the other end of the spectrum, where maybe a long, bumpy ride in the struggle bus can straighten some guys out and help them get their game back. All right, Troy, we're going to look back at week seven and start with our picks for who's hot. So right. I got the first pick, and I, I sniped you. <laughs> I admit it. I took your guy, your favorite my, defenseman. My Troy, favorite D-man in the league. <laughs> lighting the lamp a lot lately and uh, just burning up the whole NHL. At the time I did my research, which I think was a Saturday afternoon, something like that, his 35 points was first in the NHL behind Quinn Hughes with 32, and then JT Miller and David Pasternak each had 30 points. In the past two weeks, Kucherov has four goals, eight assists for 12 points, 
in six games played. And on the season, Troy, he has 15 goals, 20 assists for 35 points in 20 games played. A very healthy 1.75 goals per game average. That's Bad. that's nutty. I, it's so funny. Like I've ever since I've loved on Kucherov, and yes, people, I know he's a forward. He's not a defenseman, but I've been like kind of watching him, and it's amazing how well how good this guy is. And you'll get to why it's pretty amazing once you see his hobby market. Yeah, he's pacing for. Only 62 goals, 80 <laughs> assists for 144 <laughs> points on the season. That, that would not be bad. And Troy, it's coming off of a season ago where he had 113 points off of 30 goals and 83 assists. So over his career now, which has spanned nine years, he yep. has a total of 300-point seasons. Still just 30 years old, too, so still very much in his prime. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion in 2020 and 2021, when the Hart Trophy... Art Ross and Ted Lindsay Award in 2019. Also, has a couple other interesting NHL records, Troy. None of them are on defense. So <laughs> I apologize to you there. Dang it. So check this out. He has the most assists in a single season by a wing in NHL history with 87, which he tallied in 2018 19, a record he shares with one Yarmir Yager. Okay. Secondly, he has the most points in a single season by a Russian born player. His 128 hmm. points in 2018, 20. I would have never guessed that if you would have said who's the yeah, what Russian player has the most points in an NHL yeah. season. So I, he's definitely a player that could keep up this toward scoring pace throughout the season. It does not feel like a flash in the pan at all. But Troy, you alluded to it, and it is time to play one of your absolute favorite <laughs> games, maybe my favorite game on the show too. Mm-hmm. That of course is does the hobby care? Yep. So, Troy, today you're playing for a very fantastic prize. It's a half-opened box of 2020-21 <laughs> Extended Series. That'd be a blaster box. Sweet. Are you excited? I'm super excited. And are like the packs already ripped open. Like people already went through and took out the good cards. So I'm left with the No, garbage. just half the packs are open. So it's okay. really three packs of Extended Series retail. Okay, think carefully now. Get ready. A lot of pressure. Nikita Kucherov, Troy, has 35 points in 20 games quarter of the way through this NHL season. He leads the entire NHL in points and goals. Right? Points and goals. He's a Stanley Cup champion. He is a Hart Trophy winner. But Troy, does the hobby care? So you I'm going to I'm going to answer with a resounding no. The hobby does not care. Okay, well, let's find out. Nikita Kucherov is a 2013 Young Guns and his PSA 10 has a pop of 418 with a 60% gem rate, which last sold for 332 US dollars on November 23rd. Now, Troy, that's down 11% in the past two Why weeks. wouldn't it be down? Of course it's down it would be 12% down. <laughs> in the past month. So you are the winner yeah, of three unopened 2020 extended series retail packs because you're right. The hobby doesn't care. The hobby don't care. You lean the league and goals and points and your values are going down. <laughs> I wonder. Oh my lord! It's always that Russian thing too. Like oh, people want to bring that up all the time, and hey, maybe there's something to it. I mean, I don't know. What would it take? Like Nikita Kucherov has four thousand goals in three games. <laughs> Does the hobby care? No, he is up one percent over, over that time frame. His mom bought his card. Yeah, no kidding. All right, Josh. All right. Well, speaking of Russians, you got the. Oh, of course, I got another Russian. Russian. Yeah. This one, this one. Who? I don't know. I kind of. I went back and forth in my mind a hundred times. Should I do this guy? But we'll do it because it kind of brings up an interesting like subject. So yeah. I picked this one. Obviously, he's on a pretty good streak right now. I'll show the picture. Valerie Nishkinen. I think I said Chuskin? that one. Right. No, I didn't. I said it wrong. Nick. Oh, now I'm yeah, interested. Chuskin. Nikushkin. Nikushkin? Close enough. Nick Chushkin. Nikki C. Or Valerie. Valerie Nick. Valerie N. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> So he's on a fantastic point streak right now. Don't get me wrong. But I also wanted to bring him up because the last a lot of people remember about Valerie (laughs) Nikushkin was Nikushkin. Yeah. So it's like Nia and then Chew and then Skin. Oh, Nikushkin. There we go. Yeah. Let me me write this down. Uh, Hold on a sec. Nikush. Chew. Like Chew. 
Choo choo. Choo. And watch, I probably have it wrong. So I'm like, <laughs> great lengths to. But I think On our production right. meeting, I'm sure everyone will just love this. We're Troy figures out how to say names. All right. So, anyways, what, what a lot of people probably remember about Valerie Nikushkin is before. It might game be Valeri, th- too. Oh, man. Is it Valeri? Jeez, I give up. I don't know. Is before game three of the Avalanche's opening round series against the Kraken when he took a leave of absence due to an incident at a Seattle hotel. In addition, I'm not sure it's ever been actually confirmed what actually happened. You can read about it. You can find it on Google. It's pretty weird. We'll just say that. And the player himself and the Avalanche have refused to provide any further detail. No action was taken by the police or the NHL as they felt the Avalanche handled it. Okay. That's what a lot of people remember him for. With that being said, over the past two weeks, he's been on fire from a hockey standpoint. Over the past two weeks, he has seven goals, three assists for 10 points in six games played. Pretty good. For the season, he has nine goals, nine assists for 18 points in 19 games played. Now, I was kind of curious about this whole, you know, you have a serious situation with the player. He leaves the team during the playoffs last year, and now he's back. He is there any hobby interest in this guy anymore or what what's kind of going on with him? Plus, he will not he got interviewed, it was like a couple weeks ago. He will not talk about what happened. He's like, Nope, I'm moving on. Like, and the media will keep probably prodding him, but he will he's not saying a word of what happened. You know what's so weird I, about this whole thing though? Is yeah, in today's day and age, the fact mm-hmm. that nobody has found out the story is odd to me. Like Think it about, really must be like wild or crazy or yeah. super dark and dirty. Yeah, you're dead on. It's it's has. I mean, you can find it. Go out and you can read kind of what happened and why they called the cops and stuff. But it seems like the NHL has some. They must have some pretty good secret keepers because even when players enter the development program, we usually don't find out what it was until the players actually say if they ever want to what they went in for. So it seems like where do you apply to be an NHL secret keeper? Secret keeper. I want that job. I'd be fired yeah. right away though. I would go <laughs> on the stump show and and say. Well, Troy, <laughs> not supposed to say, but Valerie Nachuskin. Nachuskin. Vicky N, as we like to call him. No, okay. Yeah, so let's look at, let's look at, see what's going on with this guy. So he's, he's a 2013 14 Young Guns, number 236, has a PSA 10 pop of 116 with a gem rate of 71%. There are not a lot of sales on this card. Even in, Last year in October, there were a couple sales, but they were all trending around that hundred US dollar range. So I was like, well, I got a little baseline. At least I can see. I wonder what it's doing now. Recent sales in September of this year were for $33 US and 59 US dollars. So obviously quite a big drop. Again, not on a lot of sales, but you look at the situation kind of surrounding them and all the stuff that kind of came out. I can see why his values just kind of dropped. And it just looks like there's not much movement on his cards right now. I, I'm guessing he would have to stay hot for a long time and people would just kind of have to forget <laughs> what happened with him. Cause there's just, there's just this like black cloud that's going to follow him for maybe the rest of his career. I don't know. It's just, it's an interesting study in what can crop up with players and their personal issues that can affect card values out of nowhere. You know, it's just not hockey sense or hockey skill that how they play affects values. There's also other things that can come up. So I thought it was an interesting use case. He's definitely hot. I, I, I kind of went back and forth if I should include him, but decided to. No, it's good to get change it up a little bit. And I do like you making that point. One other thing I would throw into the discussion is you also have to factor in at best, right? He is maybe the fourth or fifth yeah. hobby guy on the I'd avalanche. Yeah. It's a good point. If Miko Randon can't get hobby, <laughs> no way Nichuskin is going to yeah. get hobby love for either. Okay, the last guy is not a Russian. It's a Canadian. Nope. Got to go with Kale McCarr, Troy. Nope. Nobody has more points in the NHL in the past two weeks than Kale McCarr. On the season, it's uh, Kucherov, but in the last two weeks, it's McCarr. In six games played, he has two goals, 11 assists for 13 points. And really his last couple of weeks, I think, is just a continuation of his incredible start to the season, where in 19 games so far, he's produced five goals, 24 assists for 29 points. That puts his current season pace at 125 points. 
And Troy, if he did get to that mark, it would be the fifth most in a single season by a defenseman in NHL history. Hmm. Now, the most points in a season by an NHL defenseman was 139 by Bobby Orr in 1970-71. So that, that's a little context there. And getting back to McCarr, it's his fifth season in the NHL. His best season to date was in that magical season for him in 2021-22, where he had 28 goals, 58 assists for 86 points. So he's pacing 100, what, 25? And his best season to date mm-hmm. was 86. Now, if you remember, he battled injuries a little bit last season, only played 60 games. So that kind of brought down his aggregate point totals, where he had 66 points off of 17 goals and 49 assists. A couple of interesting things, too, that I'm excited to get your perspective on. So I was looking for some more interesting Makar stats for this year. Currently, Troy, he leads the NHL in both net rating and game score, which uh, apparently is pretty incredible. So game score is a metric that evaluates single game performance. I guess it's intended to be an all-in-one stat that combines numerous factors meant to ask or answer the question, who had the best game of all the players on the ice? Uh beyond just who scored the most goals. Did I get that right? Yeah, if you want to think of it, game score was created by Dom Lushizen of the Athletic, or he's up the Athletic now. I don't think he was when he created this, but he was looking at a way to encompass a stat that was similar to WAR in baseball. So wins above replacement. So he came up with game score. And it's act- it's very well used. Uh, a lot of, it's got a lot of respect, a lot of analytical work done around it. We Everyone's got a bot into it. Yeah, we produce game score numbers for our girls on our Minnetonka, on our Tonka, Minnetonka hockey team, so it's definitely it's got it's definitely got value. And then there's an offensive rating metric and a defensive rating metric, and then net rating is just a combination of the two. So as an analytics guy, just in your profession, and as a hockey coach and hockey analytics guy as well, the fact that Makar leads the entire NHL in both game score and net rating, do you find that pretty impressive? Yeah, game score I do. Net rating I actually don't know that much about. I'm not sure. What, okay. I think we actually talked about net rating maybe a couple weeks ago, and I probably said the same thing. that I wasn't sure what it okay. was. I can't remember what it all encompasses. If it's, I'd have to look it up again. But, yes, leading the league in game score to me is impressive for sure. He also has assisted on a greater percentage of his team's total goals this season than any other player in the NHL. Kind of another amazing stat there, too. Well, here's my thing. Is he totally flipping to him? Uh, is he going to be this assist machine from now on? Are we going to see, like, 20 goals, 70 assists, 80 assists? And is that – he's just – it's weird how McCarr has – he's so good. And he had that magical season where he kind of blew up. And now yeah. I feel like he's under the radar again for some reason, even though I don't look at McCarr values every day or anything. But I'm curious to see what his values are doing. And I'm just peeked ahead, and that's very interesting. That would be like the one hobby nog is you go back to that 2021 season, he had 28 goals. Yeah. And given he's kind of pacing for 20 right now, where even though his point total, because he's become that kind of Josh Morrissey or yeah. Eric Carlson sort of assist machine from last year, but still an amazing start nonetheless. Kale McCarr is a 2019 Young Gun, says PSA 10 pop. 2,328 as a 64% gem rate. Last sold for 459 US dollars on November 25th, up 22% in the past two weeks and up 17% in the past three months, which is what you'd expect. And now you go back to Kucherov real quick and it's amazing that yeah. he's down 11%, right? Because <laughs> you can't say that maybe you would think like re- reflexively that Kucherov is down a little bit because just the general state of the hobby, your market or whatnot. But what we found so far this season, especially in doing these who hot, who's hot segments is that guys that are playing well, their cards are typically going up and Kucherov is for whatever reason, the opposite of that right now. All right. Always a piece of crap, but, (laughs) <laughs> Still on time, Troy. The struggle bus pulls up, and in a very sad and depressing way for us, this is a very, very special <laughs> struggle bus, which we'll get into in a second. Uh, well, I'll just kind of spill a little bit of the beans. It's an all wild struggle bus. Yeah, all now, wild. at one point this season, we put an entire organization, which is the San Jose Sharks, yep. on the struggle bus. And it's very tempting to do it again, 
but we'll refrain from this point uh, from doing that. Okay, so the first guy we're going to put on the struggle bus, Troy, is our guy Matt Boldy. No. Not off to the best start this year by, by any stretch. The 22-year-old wild winger has had a battle injuries a little bit this season, uh, but beyond that really isn't scoring any goals. Remember, too, Troy, we didn't need Kevin Fiala because nope. Matt Boldy was going to come in and fill that gap where it, when gave, Fiala was traded to the Kings. Yeah, and we gave Boldy a hefty contract. Hefty contract. A little bit of a tangent, too, because this got me down the Kevin Fiala, Kevin Fiala rabbit hole. <laughs> Do you remember what the Wild got back in the Fiala trade? I I don't remember. It was a player and a couple at a draft pick, right? Yeah, they got a first rounder. 2022, which became Liam Ogren, who I think is still in Europe, so haven't heard much on him. But the the player they got back was Brock Faber. Mm. So had Matt Boldy been producing, that would have actually been kind of a good deal yeah. for the Wild, just on Faber and uh, Boldy, quote unquote, taking his place as well. But okay, let's get back to Boldy. So in the last five games, Troy, he has zero goals, two assists, and is minus four, which is uh, awesome. Yeah. There was a lot, actually, a good reason to be excited coming into this year because last year he did so well where he had mm-hmm. 31 goals, 32 assists for 63 points in 81 games. This season, though, Troy, he's on pace for five goals, 32 Sweet. assists for 63 points, or, or for, for 37 points. Uh, that's not good. And, okay, so, Troy, now let's do some more hockey analytics talk here. How would you categorize Boldy's uh, mega 3.7% <laughs> shooting percentage. This oh, not good. It's got, it's like, can only go up, right? <laughs> it yeah. should go up. I hope. Yeah. That's brutal. That's, that's not good. And again, shooting percentage can be subject or depends all the opportunities could be. He's just taking terrible shots at the wrong angles yeah. or whatever. He's not making good, smart hockey plays, but yeah, 3.7 is pretty bad. And as you mentioned, he's fresh off signing a very lucrative seven year, $49 million extension for the, salary cap strapped wild boldy was asked by the athletic the other day about his struggles and here's his quote he says it happens boldy said wednesday after the wild's first practice since returning from an 00 and two trip to stockholm Mm -hmm. not really any words for it just not playing great i'll be the first one to tell you that it's no secret in my head i'm trying to do stuff to help the team get that confidence back and play my game then from that same article in the athletic there was here's another kind of snippet on Boldy's struggles that I found interesting. So it says Boldy has received a lot of tough love from coaching staff and in general manager, Bill Guerin, who has, who has been honest in his disappointment with Boldy's game. After a no goal, three assist playoff series last April against Dallas, Guerin was harsh in his exit meeting with Boldy telling him he was being way too cute and needed to get, to the dirty areas if he wanted to be a playoff performer. <laughs> you better get get in the get in the corners and get in front of the net there, Mr. Boldy. Okay, so th- then this is kind of was not part of our show notes, but I was uh, before we were looking at the show because the wild of course lost again today. So I was on <laughs> wild Twitter and I found from our beat writer, the athletic Joe Smith, he had this is from Dean Edison's uh, presser after the game today, he was asked about Matt Boldy. So here's the quote from today from Dean Evison. There's sometimes we'll take accountability, but there's sometimes a player has got to step up. Oh, I don't care how old you are. I don't care what's going on. These, those guys get paid a, a lot of money to score yeah. goals and play better. Some guys aren't. Not great. There you go. Sums that it is, up. Uh, not great. Matt Boldy, Troy, is a 2022-23 Series 1 Young Guns. His PSA 10 pop 589 has a 27% gem rate. Last sold for 88 US dollars on November 24th. <laughs> At least his gem rate is like seven <laughs> times his shooting percentage, Troy. So there's that. Uh, his young guns is actually flat over the past couple weeks, but yeah. down 32% since the start of the season. Makes so, sense. So um, not very impressive as our young Matt Baldy right now. Oh. <sighs> Sad. All right, Josh, I'm up next. I guess we're going to, you kind of spoiled it, but we've got an all Minnesota Wild struggle bus. So I'm going with Philippe Gustafsson. And <laughs> I, I wrote it myself. I'm like, I guess we both just needed outlets to vent because we're so <laughs> disappointed it's with our like team. Wild and wine line. Yeah, wild, wild wine lines. We're going to take it out in struggle bus. But our boy, 
the Gus bus has found himself on the on the struggle bus. He is, ugh. you know, and I, when I was looking at who to do, and we usually do struggle bus, I try to look back at like this defined time frame, usually around two weeks. However, when I started thinking about the struggle bus for this week, I couldn't stop thinking about how Gustafson has just been struggling all year. And it just, it, it's just something that kept nagging me. Now he's been, I'll say, okay in his last couple of games, but the whole season has kind of been bad. You got to remember, this guy comes in. He was in a, so good last week. I know. Play, I know. But, but he was not great his last season in Ottawa. Yep. I, mean, I don't think that they were like, super sad to see him go yeah and i i just get the sense and you're the goalie guy that all through last year because we we're doing our show you were yeah. never like a hundred percent sold on this guy no I, I was I, I mean i thought he was playing well it's just sometimes you notice when how they're moving and shots are going and their reaction times and sometimes i just i just something looks a little off and so i was never bought into a hundred percent but this is the guy like you said he came into this year. We come into the wild season. He's their number one. I think it's pretty clear he was the number one after a really good last season. We have Flurry at number two, and then we have Uber goalie Jesper Wallstead waiting in the wings in Iowa. So everything's set up. We're, we're wild. They got a good goalie situation. So we thought Gustafson's is going to be the guy. And then his first game, what's he do? Plays out of his mind, makes a 41 save shutout against Florida. And I think us and all wild fans are like, all right, here we go. Like, this guy's figured it out. We're going to be good to go. Well, things have not went well since then for the Gus bus. And, Josh, the one good thing is since he's on the Gus or on the struggle bus, we know that he can drive the, the struggle bus because our weird – it's was it? it's not weird, it's wild commercials. There's a Gus bus commercial, and I'm showing a picture on YouTube where he's the actual bus driver. <laughs> so yeah, he – he must have his driver's license, so we can. It's like class C you need, so we can maybe save oh, yeah. a little bit of money on a struggle bus driver <laughs> this weekend and have Gus uh, chauffeur our Matt Boldy around. And I Definitely. just to emphasize too the last season a tiny bit more. And I'm going off memory here, but I think I'm right. I believe like statistically last year, Swayman and Allmark were the top goalies, mm-hmm. but I want to say Gustafson might have been third or fourth. I, th- I think you're right. I think he was in the really top. really good last yeah, year, for sure. And so that's why I make this season get just kind of so disappointing. Right now, as of today, on the season. Well, actually, I, I didn't include the game today because I, I just found out that they lost. So Gustafson has two wins, five losses, two overtime losses, oh. and and one. I called it shutout or shout out, but the shutout. His goals against average is four point zero three, and his save percentage is point eight eight two on the season. That ain't good, Josh. No. Now, here's some other stats I kind of dug up. In his 10 games played this year, he has given up four or more goals in five of those 10 games. In fact, he has only allowed less than three goals twice in 10 games he's played this season. And hey, we can't I, score goals, so that's and not we a can't score the goals. That's kind of my next point. It's like, in, in fairness, everything is not his fault. We know that. The Wild have not played very well in front of him. Bill Guerin, like you said, went after Boldy. Well, Bill Guerin also went after the whole team and coaches when he went down to the locker room after one of their games and basically let loose how he is not happy with how they're performing. And I don't want an angry Bill Guerin yelling at me. He seems like he can be very mean and hot-headed when he needs to be. So Gustafson is on the struggle bus. He has earned a spot on the driver's seat, I guess. He'll drive it for a while, see how he does. Hopefully this last couple of games are trending him towards the right way. They still haven't been spectacular. And we have Flurry, who's I don't think has played much better. <laughs> if no. I look at the stats. Maybe Wallstead will get called up. Uh, there, the... You, the amount of times you read stuff on, hey, get let's get Wallstead up here and see what he can do. And just I think they're gonna be so careful with him because they don't want to just, just destroy him from Uber yeah. goalie and bring him up to this team that seems pretty rough right now. Okay, you tell me if I'm if, if this is just my irrational wild fans brain here, okay. and I feel like for the past three, four years now, maybe the, the wild are a very like feast or famine team. Either we completely oh, yeah. stink or we'll have a, a two month stretch where we can't lose. <laughs> yeah, we can't we'll lose. We'll go back to being horrible again. It's like they can't just be like pretty good consistently. No. 
we're just yeah we're we're famining right now we're uh rough mm. so our boy the gus bus he's a 2021 young guns psa 10 has a pop of 149 the gem rate of 45 percent recent sales have been in the 40 to 50 us dollar range However, I did find one sale around nineteen dollars U.S. dollars oh. <laughs> and verified at Terra Peak, but I kind of want—I I want to bring it up just if you see it, it's out there. But it, it seems weird. It was an auction. Maybe that was what it. I, I looked and see. I didn't see any misspellings. I was trying to think if there was some weird thing about it, but you'll see that one in there too. So at the beginning of the season, this card was trading around fifty-five U.S. dollars. So there hasn't been a lot of movement besides that outlier sale. So it's kind of just stayed. I mean, maybe you say down 10%, maybe. Okay, so I, I got a question for you then. Oh, yeah. In, in hockey, when a team is really struggling, there's limited moves that management can make in order just to do something to change, right? Where yeah. they just feel like some sort of, So sometimes you'll see the coach be, be fired, like in the case with Jay Woodcroft from the Oilers this season. Yeah. Now, Dean Evison aside, do you think that is that a move that you could see a team making and bringing Wallstead up just 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 for the sake of adding some some new element to the team to see if the team responds to that or does that not really happen with I don't think they would bring Wallstead up till the end of the year. I just think they're probably too worried that they're going to ruin this kids <laughs> with this team that's in front of them. But is there I some guess, like arbitration reasons for that too? Like they burn. I'm sure. I'm year, sure there's. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's all that stuff too. I thought you were gonna ask if Evanson's gonna get fired. I'm still convinced that once those buyouts end for Parisian Suter, then Evanson gets fired. I don't think they'll fire him before then. All right. Well, we'll spare everyone from our <laughs> wild wine wild, line. Wild wine line is now over. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So who's hot this week was Nikita Kucherov, Valerie Nuchuskin. <laughs> or whoever that guy uh, that guy you know what we need so you're looking for like one of those like button bar systems right now for a show oh, yeah. where we need some oh, sort yeah. of like we got to hire like a voiceover to person to say like <laughs> that was a gong show <laughs> to where you can just hit that about four thousand oh, times yeah. a game and then kale mccarr rounded off who's hot followed by on the struggle bus an all wild edition driven by our boy the gus uh philip gustafson in the gus bus and then he is a chauffeuring around matt boldy but really yeah. It's a big enough bus. We should have just put those. <laughs> okay, we got to make a quick mention for Gong Show partner and sponsor Slab Sharks. We are super grateful to them for their support of our show. The current Slab Sharks weekly eBay auction is live. Be sure to head to slabsharks.com for a link to the auction so you can check out all the cards and place your bids. I spent some time this weekend trying looking through the auction and was not disappointed, of course. As I like to do on Monday's show, I point out a few cards that uh, stood out to me. That Troy, that you can bid on right now. So the first one right. that I want to highlight is a two, uh, bleh, bleh, <laughs> words. Words are not coming out of my mouth. There, we need that button bar. Yes. Uh, 2012 Panini Prime Signatures Trios: Gordy Howe, Steve Eiserman, and Igor Lariana out of five. Now this is a really cool, interesting yeah. card, and I like this the way sweet. <laughs> that it's designed. I love the Red Wings theme to the card. We look at so many cards that it's becoming more and more infrequent that I see a card and I just stop and say, dang, yep. that's cool. I was even at Thanksgiving at my dad's house up in the up at the lake, and my dad was a Red Wing season ticket holder for many years. I, I had to show him this card. Yeah. Like, what do you think of this? And he, he just could care too less or could care less about a hockey card. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Next one, a 2005-06 SP Authentic Alex Ovechkin. Future Watch Auto on a 999 BGS 910. Uh, there is a that's a very big card. Yeah. But awesome. How about Troy 2015 16 Upper Deck Connor McDavid Young Gun Silver Foil, the sneaky silver foil BGS 9.5. A lot of money in burning it to uh, combine to get a silver foil there. Yeah. Uh, so let's take five regular young guns. Wow. Yeah. And then next one is a 2012-13 The Cup Tinus Timu Solani and Dale Howarchuk dual scripted sticks autos out of 15. I think this is a really cool hmm. card too. I love this card, but I just keep thing going on. Yeah, I love this card. I keep debating though if I'd rather have it not have a stick behind the auto because I I don't know. I love this card. I want this card, but I always wonder what it would look like without sticks. 
hence the name, but it would have to change it, <laughs> change whatever set insert set it's in. But yeah, this is a fantastic card. I think it would be better if they didn't have blue ink for How- Howard Chuck's auto. Yeah. Like if that was a, if that stood off the stick a little mm-hmm. bit more, but maybe like silver. Like silver, like uh, this one. Oh, yeah, silver. silver. Yeah. There you go. And then the last one that stood out to me is a 2019-20 SP Authentic Jack Hughes Future Auto oh, out of 999 PSA 10. Yeah. Subscribed. Yeah. That's a uh, very, very big card, too. And Harley thinks it's a big card as well because nope. I can hear I tried to hit the, the new button. I tried to hit the view button, but she got she got in there, I think. Hopefully, I don't know. I never know if people hear it or not, but she's uh, howling away. This last, like, 10 minutes has been... If you ever want to know why this is called the Gong Show, then that's it. But I, I kind of love it. It just makes us... It's this total Gong Show. Okay. So why are so many Canadian hockey card collectors choosing Slab Sharks for their eBay consignment services, Troy? Well, they make it incredibly easy to sell your cards on eBay to a huge and growing pool of hockey card collectors and they're very very popular weekly auctions you just ship them your cards drop them off and they literally do the rest they take the photos list your cards answer buyer questions hunt down payment ship to buyers in both the u.s and canada and then deal with any post-sale issues they are growing so fast because well they provide an awesome service so head to slapsharks.com for complete consignment information and to get started consigning your cards with them today have a new all right, Troy. Kind of excited about this one. Uh, I'm such a geek for this. The 2023-24 Winter Classic will be played this New Year's Day. Will feature a matchup, Troy, between two very legendary original 32 NHL teams in the Las Vegas Golden Knights and uh, your Seattle Kraken. It's always amazing when you get one of the original 32 or two of the original 32 playing together. So, Troy, the game will be played in the beautiful frozen tundra of Seattle, where melted snow falls from the sky almost 365 days a year. So, it's going to be a miracle to me how they pull this game off. Um, I have no idea how that's going to happen. To me, one of the more anticipated aspects of the Winter Classic is seeing the cool uniforms that teams and leagues come up with. So, we're going to cover these now, Troy, and we're going to start with the Golden Knights first. So according to the Golden Knights, their Winter Classic jerseys are inspired by old-time Vegas. I kind of get that. When you, if you can watch it on YouTube, you can see the images. There's a new V logo that includes yellow piping. And along with the font style of the uniforms that were inspired by, I guess, the uniforms worn by students at West Point. Now, Troy, I don't know about you, but when I think of Las Vegas, Military Academy is the first thing that comes to my mind. Here, mute button. Yeah, mute, Troy. The gong show continues. I can tell you this. What I do know about West Point is not in Nevada or Las Vegas. So that was interesting. Yeah, it does. I, I guess it, it is very similar. And, and anytime you pay you know, respect to the military, that's uh, that's pretty cool. But I just think it's kind of funny, the association between <laughs> West Point and Las Vegas. Overall, the color palette will hearken you back to the cowboy era of the 1910s that includes a beige uh base color some gray and then a deep gold color so troy what's your review on the las vegas golden knights winter classic uniforms i like them i like that rusted gold look i think they look pretty sweet i don't know how that if that gold is the current gold on their jerseys or not but i think the image looks cool yeah i like how it looks i think they go with more shiny gold yeah okay and i love the breezer covers or the breezers with the Vegas. I like that. I love the gloves. Anything like anytime you get the, they make the gloves look more yeah. like the old leather ones, even though of course they're not. I think that's pretty cool. So the, that's the Las Vegas Golden Knights winter classic uniforms. All right. We're going to move on to now the Seattle Kraken. Well, Troy, uh, Vegas definitely wins the Jersey unveiling photo contest. Because- yeah. This terrible photo. I mean, I'll, I'll, Spoil the lead. I love these. I love how they look. I love that the Kraken's all crazy looking and that the letters aren't lined up. I love that. But man, get a better photo for God's sake. Vegas went all out and like they had yeah. like guys with like cowboy hats and horses and they did all this crazy like post production graphics and yeah. it's like a like a JC Penny catalog picture. For yeah, the this is there. this is bad, but I, I do love them. But but there's like a, a crazy fact in here that I didn't know. So the inspiration for the Kraken's Winter Classic jerseys are to pay homage 
to the 1917 Seattle team, Troy, uh, mm. one of your favorite teams, the Seattle Metropolitans, which For were sure. the first U.S. team to win Lord Stanley's Cup. Did you ever know that? I did not know that. The jersey has a vintage, like looking horizontal barbershop striping that alternates between was it like a robin eggs blue, a navy yeah. blue, and a cream color. Yeah. And then the the logo is the big kraken S uh, in red and white. I think the numbers are in red too, with kraken spelled vert- vertically in the negative space of the of the logo. So you already said it, but you're a big fan. Yeah, of- I like these. You think that this one wins over the Golden Knights? Not for the photos, it doesn't. Man, if I man, I would love to see them next to each other. I've kind of leaned towards the Kraken. I kind of dig the colors, and I love the red S. And I, again, I love how the Kraken letters aren't lined up. They like up, down, all over the place. It kind of invokes the arms, the Kraken. It's wild. It's all over the place. I like it. So I feel like I say this a lot, but I would love to see patches from these in yeah. like really cool special cards. Yes, and. When I say I say it a lot, it's because I do, but I also feel like we never see. Do you remember a card that has like a winter classic it's patch like, in it? I'm sure there has been. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure there might be, but it seems like a lot of these get auctioned off. And they if they have a yeah. one jersey, they auction them off for charity. And which okay, I, I actually there because there's a whole debate about cutting these up and that whole debate about should these be cut up and stuff, but I would love to see these in a patch. Could you imagine that eye in a like a monumental patch? I mean, come on. That'd be sweet. That'd be cool. Mm-hmm. All right. Next story, Troy. Uh, getting back to our wild here. It's been kind of a wild <laughs> well. show. We have a Mark Andre Fleury helmet kerfuffle. So did you see this whole issue between him I and did. the NHL? I did. And I I love <laughs> I love my boy Fleury just as like whatever. <laughs> so as a reaction to last year's issues, I think mainly regarding to the Pride Night celebration yeah. and well, I don't know how you want to put it, how those are handled, their controversies around it or whatever. The NHL's Board of Governors this summer instituted a bunch of new rules to crack down yep. on players showing support for special initiatives uh, on their equipment. So on Friday, Marc-Andre Fleury defied these new rules <laughs> and wore a special helmet he had made custom to commemorate Native American Heritage Month for the Wilds game against the Avalanche. The helmet was commissioned to honor the heritage of his wife and children, who uh, are of Native American descent, his wife is. So therefore, his kids, of course, are too. The art on the helmet was designed by a Native American artist named Cole Redhorse. And here's a quote from the artist, uh, Mr. Redhorse. I was very humbled to represent my community and my family this way. The helmet will be up for auction after this weekend, going back to a point you just made about like these special uniforms. All proceeds will go towards a Native American-led charity that assists with indigenous families in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Red Horse, I guess, wrote on Instagram. I would say in a good move. I, I think that the NHL before the game had threatened to fine Flurry, and he was, like you said, going to just pay the fine and stand up for a cause that he believed in and, uh, and was willing to do that. But now I, I don't think the NHL is expected to hand down any disciplinary action. Yeah, and it, I... But this whole thing is becoming kind of a mess, though. Wouldn't you agree? And Oh, it is a mess. It's a complete mess because the NHL just likes to keep putting their foots in their mouth. They'll come up with something. Then everyone screams at them. They'll do something else. And then they do something else. And the new policy, no one knows what the policy is now. But one thing with Flurry too, this thing was like back and forth. Like he's going to wear it. He's not going to wear it. They're going to get fined. It's going to be a huge fine. And then I think at the end of the day, because he only wore it during warmups, he didn't wear the mask during the game. I think that's probably why the NHL is like, all right, we're not gonna we're not gonna do any more action. But NHL, just make your rules, I guess, and stick to them. I don't know. It we can go back and forth on what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. But at some point, NHL just can't keep making a rule, backtracking, make another rule, backtrack. I don't know what you do, but it it comes down. Do you want to give the players the freedom to support causes they want? Or do you want to try to be this big organization and shut it all down because you don't want to make anyone mad? That's they got to decide where they want to live with that. I think the NFL dealt with this a couple years ago, and I, I don't know if yeah. they still do it because we don't have time to follow that league <laughs> anymore because of the show. But I feel like they went like nuts for like a month or a couple weeks where they said, "Okay, players, you can do like hand towels or shoes, or you can't. Yeah. I get you can't like alter your jersey or something like that because that." 
goes to the brand of the team, but mm-hmm. there's certain equipment that they've allowed. And I think players get like, it's like a big business. They get their shoes like custom painted to support yep. whatever charity or cause that they want. And I would love to see the NHL do that to, you know, you'd have to have some sort of guidelines, of course, so that people weren't doing anything overtly controversial or yeah. like hate or discriminatory or anything like that. But then given this is a hockey card show, and I feel like this is something fanatics would do, but get the upper deck partner with the NHL partner with the NHL PA. You want to talk about auctioning off for charities. You create some sweet memorabilia cards from custom gloves or yeah. socks or skates or whatever you let these players do, put those into cards and man, you can get some big money for these, for these charities and create some really cool cards along the way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm glad though that flower kind of stood up for what he did. <laughs> kind of a cool yep. story, especially to, if he's honoring his family. All right. Last hobby new story, Troy question of the day. Did Ovi and Sid save the NHL? Ovi thinks so. Yeah, he does. Again, I, I think the best, some of the best hockey, just general hockey content out there is the athletic. And one of their ra- writers, Rob Rossi, this week did a big profile piece on Ovechkin and Crosby. The article focuses on their rivalry and then sort of the inevitable changing of the guard in the NHL is both near the twilight of their respective careers. So but the, the, the main headlines from the article was Ovechkin's assertion that it was both him and Crosby rivalry that it, quote saved the NHL as they burst onto the scene after the 20, 2004 lockout in which they both used their competitive spirit and rivalry with each other to push each other to greater heights. And as their careers progress, they're kind of still showing that competitive spirit, I guess, as the new generation of stars is threatening to push them (laughs) out of the limelight a a little bit. And we'll get to Ovi real quick, but even kind of Crosby got into the mix and you know he's so reserved usually, but here's kind of an interesting quote from him in the article. He said, uh, it says, well, Crosby didn't go so far to say bring it on, but he did say, and this is a quote, hopefully we're still a little bit away from being pushed out of the way. Well, he for sure I, is. I think it's about he's as on, frontal as City yeah. Crosby gets. Right? He's on fire. Like, maybe he should have oh, been on. He's had a, a tremendous year. So I, I I agree with him 100%. Yeah. And then, of course, Ovi is a little bit more blunt. He said, we yeah. saved the league. Now they come in. I think they is these young stars. Yeah. And I guess we're old news, Ovechkin says. But we saved it. It's up, it's up to those guys to come in and prove me wrong that we're not the best. So do you like this scene a little spunk? Oh, yeah. And, and uh, something in vinegar out of uh, Ovi and Crosby here, Troy? Oh, yeah. I love it. I Did they save the NHL? Probably not. But they probably brought it into a new spot that it hadn't been in. It was kind of trudging along. And these two come along and just take it to the next level. I think the NHL would still be here if they, were, if they weren't here. Yeah. But... I agree with him. It, it's they upped the game and it brought it to a new level. Well, and I think that they ultimately changed the hobby too. They yeah. really ushered in the modern era of hockey card yep. collecting. And what I would say too is of any current players in the NHL, in my mind, they're the only two certifiably bankable legendary players that 15 years from now, people will still be going nuts over their cards. Yep. You can say McDavid, but there's that whole Stanley Cup the thing. Whole cup thing. And, you know, hanging over his head and these are the only two that there's just no in my mind question about yep. okay troy we've got a lot going on in new product releases all right uh some big big news to dive really deep into but first just wanted to mention that 2022 23 extended series is now available on epac so the price per pack if you want to buy on a per pack basis 549 us price per box 124 us dollars oh, and a Case price is 1480 US dollars. Now, like with EPAC in these releases, the base set is typically digital only. So that's the 200 card base set. Um, and then, but, but really beyond that, the kind of configuration is basically the same. So, like in Hobby, there's a combination of six young guns or first round rookies cards in the box. So there isn't 50 young guns on the checklist and extended mm-hmm. because it would get way, way obscure if they you know, 150 young guns a year. You'd have a lot of mascot young guns. <laughs> yeah. Trainer, assistant <laughs> trainer, young guns, right? Uh, and then, of course, the big, the biggest kind of exclusive cards from EPAC when it comes to flagship products are your typical silver foil parallels, 
and speckle rainbow foils. Remember, if you combine five copies of any individual young guns, or in the case of Extended Troy, one of the first round rookie cards, you'll receive a silver foil parallel of that card. And then combining three of the silver foil parallels, well, of the, again, the young guns or first round rookie cards gets you that speckled rainbow. So it really takes, if you think about it, 15 base cards for either young guns or first round rookies to end up with that speckled rainbow card. There's also 18 various achievements that you can check out for yourself if you go to Upper Deck, Upper Deck's EPAC website. Um, but though, and this kind of gets me to the main point on this, and this is sort of a theme that we're starting to see with EPAC. If you're vying for those silver foils or you like those speckled rainbows or whatever various achievement cards, bro, you're going to pay a big premium by yep. playing in the extended game on EPAC because of what you can get physical hobby boxes of extended series these days. I think right now, David Adams, is something like 95 US dollars. But at the expo, it was like 80, yep. 80 Canadian at the expo. Yep. Yep. Right. And, and so you can find some really good deals. And when you compare that to 124 US for the EPAC price, man, you really got to want those like <laughs> rainbows because yep. you're paying, what, a 40% premium for EPAC? Maybe something like that. Uh, yeah. I'm going to stick to hobby on this one. What about you? Yeah, I'm, I just, yes, I'm sticking to hobby. And and I think hobby. especially too, because the biggest chase is the young on acetates, right? Yep. Like that, that, that's what really kind of made this product kind of awesome. We're yeah. extended has been a little bit tougher to kind of wrap your head around or get excited about in the past. And then one other quick thing before we get into kind of our big news and really the meat of the episode is as far as like what could come out next, things are pushed back a little bit. It, I'm guessing it's either going to be 2022, 23 SP game used, 2023, 24 artifacts, which would be an interesting one, given some big Bedard redemptions in there. Yeah. Or maybe finally 2022, 23 Parker's Champions. It looks like December 16th or 13th would be likely the next release date. There's part of me that kind of wonders if Upper Deck is putting the brakes on because of all the chorus that's been on the hobby about it, just that these are coming out way too fast. Yeah, could be. It's a lot of, or, or lot maybe, of maybe it's coincidence. You never know. Yeah, I. That's probably a little bit of both. But I think having a break is good. Is good, and then we'll be pretty excited what comes out. Uh, I just hope that SP Game Use actually has Game Use products. <laughs> oh, shot fired there, I guess. Okay, Troy. Here's the big news. Yeah. No. We also have, as of a few days ago, a tentative release date for 2021-20 to the Cup which right now is scheduled to be released right before Christmas on December 23rd, 2023. So if you haven't already got my Christmas present, Troy, uh, there's an idea right there for you. Right now, pre-sales on Dave and Adams here in the U.S. are $1,100. US So if you remember, 2020-21, the cup last fall or spring, debuted at $1,250 US. So and now it's like that that release is actually selling right around $1,000. Yeah. This is kind of... Um, not really surprised, I guess, about the price, no, but it's what we thought. But it is interesting that it's down a little bit, so maybe that's indicative of a little where the hobby's at. The configuration looks pretty much the same, so it's a one pack per tin. Remember, it's not a box of the cup, it's the tin, and then you get six cards in that pack. Along with the pre sales being live, too, Troy, the, the sell sheet or solicitation, as they call yeah. it, has been made, which includes a, a number of preview images of the cards, and want to roll through those right now. and kind of get your thoughts and we'll do our best to be as descriptive as possible for anyone listening to us on the various podcast apps. Uh, but uh, you got to start with the cup with the RPAs and exquisite RPA designs. So off the bat, they have Jeremy Swayman as the subject of their example for a true RPA. This is the gold foil parallel, which I think is out of what, 24 or something like that, maybe 25. Yeah. 24, I think. Yeah. So what's interesting, the first thing I noticed is that the patch window for this release is on the left-hand side of the card, where it was on the right-hand side of the card mm. in 2020. So that's like one thing that they're doing to mix it up a little bit. And overall, I mean, I guess I'm a I'm a big fan of the design. It's kind of clean, simple. I like it. Do you like it? Yep, looks good. You know, it's kind of what you'd expect. Yeah, it's, it's like not blowing me away, but it looks very nice, very clean. I don't, I, it's like something I'm not going to be like, no, that's terrible. It looks great. Or it looks really nice. 
Okay, so now we're going to move on to the big ex exquisite cards. So first there's the exquisite RPA and then, and then limited logos. So the exquisite RPA design has Mason McTavish as the sample uh, or the subject of it. There's kind of a distinctive, like what do you call like marble or granite sort of background behind yeah. the player. But beyond that is kind of that museum look you see with the cup mix of white and gray, a really big patch window. Yeah, it's kind it's of huge. funny. I, I feel like that I've heard, whether it's like from Mitch Grotman or somebody else, that the patch window is always the same like area, like oh, really? measurement of area. But that sometimes they they will kind of play with the design of the border, you know, the shape of it. So it it feels huge though in this. It region. does. I thought that was the first thing that came to my attention. I was like, wow, that looks huge. But yeah, I dig it. Another thing you got to note, and we saw this with the stature release, is that. These are when you see these images, it's not the like it's dummy patches that they digitally yes. put into the cards. Uh, we saw that with the Owen Power 101 Wonderkin yeah. that was pulled from Stature because that was the card that was used as an example in the solicitation, and the patch was not as great as in the previous yeah. sheet in, in real life. So just keep that in mind when if you're looking uh, uh, at a show right now on YouTube or on like Beckett or, or Cardboard Connection or something like that. Then though, Troy, here's where we get. There's two kind of major. Uh, yep. I don't know what, what to say. Sticking points with me, but we'll yep, get to stick, that right now. I, where you're going, I, I let out a big sigh when I saw this. Yeah. So it's one of the first things that I, I instantly realized, and what they show in the solicitation is there's a 2003 for exquisite uh, tribute design for limited logos. Yeah. Very very nice looking card. Yeah. That patch is ridiculous if that were the yep. patch itself. I like the mix of black and white um, very, very much so, like the design of this card. And Cole Caulfield is the subject. But when you look at the logo area, yep. um, there's a kind of a very distinct and noticeable difference than yep. any of the other example cards in the logos. And then it seems pretty clear that there's a sticker outline around. Yes. Now, Cole Caulfield has this like teeny tiny auto. So that would be like a weird sticker. But I don't know. And again, I looked at they, they have like what dozen examples of cards with autos. And this is the and remember, these aren't like with... the suit, these aren't super high res photos they provide. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it but it's doesn't... kind of plain yeah. as day, though, right? Yeah, I well, I think so, but I don't know. I, I, I don't want to make any any accusations until we have confirmation. It just it looks like something, but again, these photos aren't the highest quality, so I don't know. I did reach out to Upper Deck for a confirmation. Did not okay. get back. Not super well, yeah. shocked. They don't like to talk about the cup, yeah. which I get that. But it would make sense, though, given that there's been a lot of issues with Cole Caulfield autos in the last number of, you know, half a dozen or so releases. We had a missing from credentials, remember? Yeah. We had the whole stature kerfuffle where he wasn't there originally, and then they did <laughs> some sort of uh, yeah. program is his autos were sticker autos in Ultimate Collection. So, in a way, this could be Upper Deck foreshadowing that Caulfield autos could be stickers in the cup. You're right. We have no confirmation. That's just maybe an assumption that we're making based on yeah. the image that we're seeing. But in a way, though, I think that would be a good thing if that is the case, that they're kind of telegraphing that now so that people can't accuse or be accusatory yeah. saying, Never it was a hard either. signed auto in the exam in the examples you've shown, and now it's a sticker. It very, yeah, very I, clearly looks like a sticker auto. Yeah, and I again they're going back to like the retro well on this one, which you like this design. I I think it's fine, it looks good, but I always it's always weird to me that the Canadians logo has the same size as the upper deck logo. <laughs> like I just I always felt that was a little weird. And then the, the picture of the player is like super small. And he's always, it's my boy, Cole Caulfield, always has the worst pictures, no matter what. Whatever card it is, he's always got a terrible picture. There's certain players like that always have like their mouth open in a weird <laughs> yeah. way. Like Matt Boldy is one. Brady Kachuk is yeah. actually another one that I've noticed that on too. So, yeah, we could have, right, two years in a row where we have sticker autos in the cup. We could yeah. have. Again, all we're going off of is what we're seeing. So if this is the case, Troy, and it is going to happen, that we're going to have sticker autos of, again, the best rookie in the class, do you think that there's going to be 
the same degree of consternation as there was when 2020 came out or are people kind of is this happen so frequently now that I, we're just sort of used to it and we move on i think people will still be up in arms i think if it happens for a third year in a row then it kind of becomes a trend <laughs> and the people just accept it but i think if we have another year of stickers on certain guys especially this is the big guy right this is the guy isn't it in the 21 oh yeah yeah he's like, the man for sure and i think that's that's, I think it's going to cause an issue again. Maybe not as, maybe not as much of an issue as the 2020 Cup with those uh, sticker autos, but I think it's still be an issue. Believe it or not, and we'll get to it in a minute. This is not what I'm fired up the most about about this release, but uh, <laughs> we got some some other designs to get to before we get there. Okay. So the next design is the one of my favorite cards in the Cup are the monumental rookie patch auto booklets. Yep, they're sweet. These look awesome as usual. I mean, it's pretty hard to make this card look bad but yeah i actually like the window the patch window designs i think in this case is it officer bob is that who it is no it's spencer knight because these are rookies oh yeah 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 spencer knight i'm sorry um yeah the the patches are ridiculous yeah right this would be an amazing card to pull in the cup anything you have to add to that no i think these look great and actually i do have something to add on spencer knight i was when i was flying back from toronto i went to the newsstand at the airport and I got the hockey news like goaltender issue, and they had a really nice write up on Spencer Knight and like all the stuff he was dealing with when he entered the player program, because it was OC right, o- obsessive compulsive, OC. yeah OCD. And it got so bad where he would leave his house for practice, and he'd re- would return to it like four different times to check if he locked the door. Yeah, you have those like rituals, right? And yeah, and it becomes it very kept debilitating. Getting, kept getting worse, 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 and you read about all the stuff, and you're like, "Holy cow! No wonder he was." I mean, that's <laughs> that's not. Or you have to, like, like people have to like turn on and off the lights twenty times yep. before they leave. Like yep. exact number. Yeah. Uh, very sad when people have to deal with that. Okay, so the next kind of category of cards is what Upper Deck calls Cup Classics, and okay. the first one is Emblems of Endorsement, and this is another one of my favorites. I yeah. really like the design. Of this year the subject in the example from upper deck is austin matthews it's a vertical card design yeah so it's got two smaller patch windows but they put his name in between the windows i love that i like how they did yeah. that and then the auto is kind of really big space at the auto or bottom of the card for the auto one of the things i love about cup cards is that they really design them around autos the cards that are supposed to have them yeah and uh again i just think really clean design i like that it's vertical and i'm a fan of the emblems of endorsements okay then there's enshrinement duos which is another kind of really clean i'm a big fan of this card too so it mm-hmm. features two players from the same team we haven't seen the checklist let yet so i don't know if it's all legendary players but in the example here it's joe sackrick and patrick waugh from the avalanche which would be an awesome yeah. auto card to have what i like about it is that they put the enshrinements badging and the cup logo kind of vertically down the middle of the card sort of separating half the card for patrick waugh and the other half for joe sackett do you, like, you like these ones yeah these look nice I, I like them and i know that like you don't prefer horizontal over I, was, I was just gonna say like for a horizontal card i do like this card. Yeah, that's what i was gonna say like <laughs> very good use of that horizontal yeah. space so uh super like good strategically thinking designer yeah. came up with this card and did uh, a really good job okay now here's my single greatest critique of this yep. whole product i want to be careful here because i want to be fair yeah and and admit that this is totally a personal kind of issue and bias yep. but this card troy if you're watching on youtube it's called inked insignias the example subject is Kale McCarr. Mm-hmm. Really nice looking card. Very well designed. Kind of a good mix of like gold and black or kind of like a dark gray and, and the museum look of the white of that you expect with the cup. Nice auto. But there's a big window with a manufactured patch yep. featuring the team logo. I don't want to buy an $1,100 yep. box of cards and pull a card with the manufacturer i'm like instantly depressed when i pull this card and i guarantee you if i were to spend 1100 bucks on a box of the cup i would get one of these cards because that is my luck (laughs) and 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 it would be ryan (laughs) o'reilly patch booklet i 100 percent would pull this i just really really strongly believe that 
no cup card should have. I think, I mean, they should all be game worn. But I, I get sort of like a lot of them on the rookie cards have to be photo shoot because they're not made in time to have played many games and have that many game materials. But like a, a, in 2021 product, a Kale McCarr manufactured patch auto literally does absolutely nothing for me. Am I going overboard no. here or? No, I no, no, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate. Are we 100% sure that's a manufactured patch? 100% sure. It says okay. right on this solicitation. Okay, that's why I was gonna. Well, again, I was gonna look it up while I asked that question because that's. I was like, maybe it's you know something that's on the jersey, but whatever. I agree with you 100. percent Oh, that they're I very think, open about it. That it's a manufacturer yeah. patch. Well, to me too, and we hear this many times that the cup is the highest end product. The NHL wants it to be the highest end product. Part of me thinks the NHL kind of missed out. Like I would, would like them to be like, hey, we're not gonna have manufactured patches in this. This is our highest product. This is the top, the cream of the crop. I don't want manufactured patches in it. It, yes, you're. It, it, it bothers me. I'll, I guess I'll have to live with it, but it's. I don't like it. And when I say I want to be fair, it's maybe some people like these, and maybe it's just me and my yeah. own stupid bias. Yeah. So I'm not trying Could to be. say that I know anything and everything or represent all the interests of everybody that collects in this hobby. I would just be super mad. <laughs> Yeah, if I if I pulled this card out of a more than a thousand dollar box yeah. of hockey cards, but again, that, that that's just me. You know what? I I'd be I'd be, I'll be very curious on how these price out because to me it's almost does it just price out of what the auto would be <laughs> like? Does the patch even add any value to it? If you go back though, and again, this is where I'll, again I'll go back to what I just said, where maybe I'm the idiot. Maybe go look at. I think it was out of Black Diamond. They had like team. Like jumbo patches or like yeah. rookie jumbo patches. Yeah. But they were like, again, it was like a, a very big manufactured patch that had the team's logo and like Maddie Beneer's autograph. These were selling for like 800 bucks or something. Yeah. So maybe so we're the like, idiots. <laughs> maybe we're the dumb ones. Maybe. I don't know. But for my money, yeah, I, this is, I generally have loved what we've seen so far. I agree that, you know, that there's probably circumstances that, would fall out of upper decks control. And if there is sticker autos for Cole yeah. Copfield, then maybe there's some real good explanations for it. This is the one that's really hard for me to get behind, but yeah. okay, we'll move on now, Troy. I kind of want to do a, a batch and because we like games. We're going to play a little game with you again okay. here. There is a, a whole bunch of new cards yeah. coming to the cup this year. So we're going to play a game called love it undecided or pass. So you're going to, for each one of these new designs, yep. you're going to say, I love it. I haven't made up my mind or nope, I'm out. I'm going to pass. So the first one, which is on our screen here, if you're watching on YouTube is national colors autographs. These are all numbered cards. They feature stars, legends, and bets. So all three kind of different categories of players. And the cards are themed according to the nationality of the players. So in this case, it's a Timmy Stutzla. It's got the German colors uh, from the flag there of red and yellow. Um, there's black, but there's no black in the background of the card, but he's wearing a black uniform. Yeah. Then it's got a big Timmy Stutzla auto in a, a kind of a white ink. So what do you think of these new inserts, Troy? Love it, undecided, or pass? Pass. I don't like it. I, I've never been a national, like the flags, when they have flags in the background, it's just, it's not my gig. Yeah. Well, you America or bust, or you just don't respect any? No, no, I just, I... <laughs> I'd rather have any. Yeah, no kidding. America. No, I just rather would have NHL teams. I'm not the biggest like international yeah, gotcha. card guy. Now, where I see this being cool is like for those countries that don't have a lot of NHL players, maybe Germany, right? Like if, if you're a German citizen, yeah, this would be I an think awesome then card. it's cool. Maybe it's just I'm, you know, what first world problem where we have so many Americans, so many Canadians, where maybe that it doesn't it doesn't hold as much meaning. But I would rather. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, Germany is the first round. <laughs> yeah, third world baggage. Well, yeah, it's true. <laughs> Duh. Okay, next one, try dual ticket booklet. Yeah, you gotta explain this to me because I don't okay. get. The, I don't get the ticket. I don't. I, I didn't either. I don't get it by looking okay. at it. But so it says it showcases rival players, their autos, and a ticket stub from when the two met in a specific game. Now the example they show is Joe Pavelski from Dallas. And oh, Roman Yossi of the yeah of the Nashville Predators. So the first thing that came to my mind is: are, are, 
is this like a huge rivalry between these two guys that I just don't understand? <laughs> or it's, it seems like a little bit of a like we just talked about like now a Crosby Ovechkin part yeah. of this would be amazing. Oh, you know, there's gotta be there's gotta be one, right? Yeah, there's I would hope so. Be. But but the ticket stub doesn't look like a ticket to me. Well, really either. Yeah, I, I see here where it says row price. I'm sorry, the the quality on these pictures isn't that great from the sell sheet. And maybe this was a picture from the stuff. Again, if these were inserted in as digital files, maybe they just made one up and called it good. But yeah, it'd be, I'll be interested to see what these look like and what, what the checklists look like of what players are on these. Please come out. I actually, I don't mind the concept. I think the concept's pretty neat. Yeah. The other thought I had is, is there any version of a physical ticket anymore? Like you to, It's like a picture of a phone, <laughs> essentially. A yeah, that's QR that's, code on a phone. I that depresses me. Like I have a box of all ticket stubs I've ever saved, and it depresses me that that kids oh, today don't ha- that don't have that experience. Okay, so Troy, which one is oh dual ticket booklets? Okay, so I'm. Are you a love it undecided? Or I'm gonna go love it. I love it. Okay, good. The next new card is called player plaques. So these Troy are vertical booklets. Hmm. That feature a player's auto and then commemorate significant moments in that player's career. So, first question I have for you: This is not related to the this specific one, but I know you like vertical cards over horizontal. When it comes to booklets, <laughs> you prefer vertical or horizontal? Oh. I don't know. Probably I. I don't know. I'd probably like a horizontal booklet. That to me is a book. I, I actually don't have, I don't even know if I have. Are your P.E.K.K.A.s hor- vertical? I'm, I was trying to look over at them real quick. I can't even remember yeah, what yeah. they are. Of course, they're turned upside down, so I can't see them. But, um, but so, so on, the, on this, this card. Yeah, I'm going to say on this card, I'm undecided. I actually, if that bottom half, if you're not watching on YouTube, it looks like on the top half of the book is a picture of the player, whatever his moment is. And then on the bottom, it's like the plaque, I'm assuming, is what they're calling it. I'm curious if that's metal or what is that? It's like, what's the material used there? Because that could be really yeah. cool if it's like a, a shiny metal and the auto kind of sticks out or looks good. But I think I'm undecided, but I'm, I'm leaning towards liking it. Yeah. I, I don't love the design of this. It, it looks a little bit like a 1990s employee of the month certificate. I was going to say, I, guess I was hoping you were going to say like, uh, like windows paint or something. <laughs> no, no. I it, it's it's a it's a fine like design. It just yeah. the, the aesthetic doesn't speak to me. So yeah, but that's just me. Okay, then lastly, try I kind of save the best for for last. The basics, probably the most interesting. Yeah, new design for this cup release. Yep, I'm guessing it's very much going to be a love hate with yep. many collectors. Very colorful. There's like three color circles, like what they call like concentric circles that kind of like in a Venn diagram fashion yep. that yep. come together. And then the shared area between the three. Well, it's not really the shared area because the top circle. It's there's my the there's my issue with the whole card is I okay. I don't mind the color. Love color. I, I'm yeah. fine with the color. However, a Venn diagram is an intersection between two things. Right. So yeah. it's like kids that ate apples kids that ate oranges and then the middle would yeah. be the kids that ate apples and oranges it just in my my head this doesn't make sense basics don't <laughs> the word basics doesn't venn diagram into the middle i get it's the patch i i know what they're going for i just it's something a little and then the i don't really understand one, the theme yeah. either like well like what does the basics mean maybe yeah maybe once it's explained it'll make a little more we'll sense talk to but yeah. yeah and two Maybe you have to see it in hand because sometimes, yeah. as we know, and we've learned a lot over the past yeah. year, that the, the pictures sometimes uh, from the solicitations only tell half the story. So, Correct. Uh, but it, from all we can go off is what we see, Troy. So, the hockey hobby world is waiting. Do you love it? Yeah. Are you undecided? Or are you a pass? Right now, I'm passing unless there's some big explanation that I, <laughs> that I can get behind, but I'm going to pass for now. There's a bunch of other designs that you can check. Well, I'd say a few, maybe went through half or something like that. Yeah. If you want to see the rest of them, just Google 2021, 22 the cup, and you can go to Beckett or Cardboard Connection or go to one of the big online retailers. They'll have the solicitation sheets there. Again, pre-sales are at 1100 US dollars. 
Now, averages, tin averages, because it's not a box. Yeah. For 2021-22, the cup bar. So you get one base rookie patch auto, which is out of 99 or out of 249. One additional patch auto, which is a rookie veteran legend. One auto card that's non-memorabilia. Two non-auto memorabilia cards. And one base card out of 249. So you, get, you do get three autos in a box and two patch autos. Overall thoughts? So far, I I'm I like it. I'm not like 100 sold on every card design in there, and yeah. it will be interesting to see what happens with what if any of the sticker auto stuff comes out or the Caulfields or whatever it's going on with that. I'm not a fan of the pricing, even though it's what I expected. I and then I I'm still 2022 23 pricing is where I'm really excited to ever find out what that comes out at even though that's totally unrelated. It's, it's gonna have to it's gonna have to be less because yeah. the class when when one of your the big rookie is Matt Boldy and yeah we just talked about him yeah um, yeah it's the strength of the rookie class factors in yeah okay need to make a quick mention for PWCC which of course is a partner and sponsor of our show uh, we're very very grateful to them for their support. Quick reminder, the De- December PWCC Premier Auction begins December 7th, so bookmark that. We'll run through December 21st. The Premier Auction features the best of the best cards. Um, huge heritage for PWCC in this auction. In the hobby, always appointment viewing, so I'll be really excited on December 7th, like I am every month, to see what hockey cards are included in the upcoming Premier Auction. But while you're waiting, remember to check out their fixed price marketplace at pwccmarketplace.com. More than 1,500 cards a month sell from mm-hmm. this that you can track. We track the card ladder. So there's a lot of daily deals that happen out of their fixed price marketplace. There are over 5,000 hockey cards available to, to check out. You can make offers on a lot of them. So again, a great resource to find some cool cards. And then finally, the current PWCC weekly auction is live. We'll end this upcoming Sunday night. We're going to cover our favorite vintage and modern cards in the auction on Thursday show like we always do. And then we'll join Jeremy Lee uh, on Sunday night to cover the best of the the best hockey cards closing in the auction in our PWCC weekly hockey uh, auction weekly auction hockey watch party, which is on Jeremy's YouTube channel. Sports Cards Live starts at eight thirty p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay, Troy, mailbag time. Another big mailbag. mailbag. Lots of deep questions. This yeah, uh, <laughs> God, you guys are making us think. <laughs> We're not good at that, but uh, a lot of, a lot of really interesting questions too. So can't wait to get into it. First question from Instagram. Uh, good friend, Adam Luck. Did I predict discontinue rookie breakouts out of a hundred? I can't find anything in 2022, 23 or 2023, 24. Looks like you are correct. Yep. I found zero sales for 2022, 23 or 2023, 24. Kind of a bummer too, and these cards are actually pretty cool. Yeah. So they're they feature like a combo of acetate and foiling, and I really like that combination. And I, I guess I'd maybe call them like a cousin to Young Gun acetates, and they're limited, kind of a case hit maybe mm-hmm. in the I think they're in the flagship products, if my memory serves correct. So yeah, for some reason they were discontinued. It looks like, and then you did some additional digging, Troy. Well, yeah, I just went on and looked at the checklist that I could find, and they weren't anywhere on there so it sounds like they might either put a pause on them or discontinue them for now all right next question discord t olson 70 real deep question here uh, but a good one i like it how does hobby relevance change if hobbyists don't adjust example dylan cousins is the hobby hit in a lot of breaks for buffalo yet is being outplayed by jjp JJP. buffalo who has relatively low hobby relevance is it just a timing thing, or is the hobby so locked in on a perceived hobby stars that other potential hobby targets are reprimanded to the second or third tier? So, I, I man, tough question. I think the when you look at like the ingredients that make up the recipe that is hype in the hobby, it's obviously a very clo- or closely held secret by the hobby <laughs> guy, because nobody knows. Ultimately, yeah. we can guess in each case, but. Like I said, nobody really knows. Like you think of, again, why do David Pasternak or Nikita Kucherov have almost no hobby hype? They, there's not a solid rational explanation for it. There just isn't. And then in the case, like, specifically that you bring up with Cousins, maybe, I, I don't know, the, the timing was a factor. He was in that that really kind of unique 
2020 class that was in the bullseye yeah. of the pandemic where that the prices were skyrocketing on all sports cards. And a lot of guys out that said just got a natural amount of hype. So I don't know. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's to do with the Sabres just in general. And that beyond Tage Thompson, nobody has clearly asserted themselves as the number two hobby guy. So here you have like Cousins, Jack Quinn, JJP, Devin Levi, Rasmus Dahlin, and Owen Power. We've said this a million times. You're lucky to have two hobby stars yep. on one team. You're not going to have seven. So I think that's a risk if you want to invest in Sabres cards and trying to figure out, again, beyond Thompson, who is that second guy? Do you have any thoughts, Troy? I'm right with you. you way better answer than I could ever came up with. <laughs> Okay, next question. Discord, you're making me nervous. Who is your favorite European-born player, and why is it Yager? <laughs> well, I got to go with the goals and the hair, but not in that order. It's the hair. So, so you're going with Yager, and I'm Pally Lindbergh all the way. I just, by far, he'll always be my favorite. He's from, is he from Finland or Sweden? Lindbergh was... Oh God! How do I not know this? Off the Wait, top I'm, of my head, I'm, I'm I'm think... the yeah. <laughs> it's got to be Sorry, Sweden. Man. It's got to be Sweden. Let me look. Let me look. Dun, 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 dun. We might have another Kucherov moment here. Yes, he's Sweden. I I knew that. Yes, it's Sweden. I looked it up. All right. Next question. Instagram distress clouds. Is it just me, or is Allure not being opened up as much this year? I think that's to do with just the general tonnage of products yes. that have come out in such a short time over the last couple of months that <laughs> uh, a number of these products are just getting lost in the shuffle. Yeah. You know, Allure it's is not due a great to, example. It's not due to us. We open Allure. We like Allure. <laughs> I love Allure. We opened a lot at the <laughs> yeah, Expo. Expo. We're getting really cheap. It, the other factor might be that 2022-23 rookie class is not very good. Yeah. So I think that makes it a little bit less exciting. But I'm a big fan of Allure, and I'm really excited the direction the product's going, and yep. um, can't wait to see what next, next year's product looks yep. like. Next question, Instagram, 816 cards and collectibles. Really, really good question. When you sign up with a consignment shop or seller, do you still need to comp all of your cards that you send to them? Like if I wanted to send in 500 plus cards that were all inserts, numbered, auto, jersey, et cetera, do I need to comp everything I send them before sending? Not sure if it's the same for all consignment sellers or not. Obviously, Slab Sharks is a good resource, but if you do, but not if you live in the states. I know they're a sponsor, so it's kind of a must-say kind of thing. But what other consignment sellers are convenient for U.S. buyers or sellers? So I actually reached out to Slab Sharks and asked, well, if you're in the U.S., can you still work with them? And you can. You just have to like ship them your cards, and if they're under two hundred dollars with twenty-five dollars declared value, you can ship via to their PO box via the mail service, or over two hundred dollars, you should ship. Uh, via FedEx. So uh, just want to make that clear that you can still work with them in the U.S. if you want your cards in their auctions. I don't think you need to comp everything when you said then that's part of why you use a consignment service. But if you're going to send 500 plus cards, you whoever you use, I think you definitely want to reach out to. Yes. Because they might have yes. like minimum, like they don't say we only want cards that are value $25 or more or something like that. And you just want to make sure that you can at least make those minimum thresholds and they may not be able to process 500 cards from you at once. So it's a communication thing. Don't just blindly, I think, send them. As far as other options in the US, honestly, Slapsharks is the only, we're not big users of consignment services. I'm not trying to just cater to a sponsor here, although we do really really believe that well, I mean, you can say pwcc probably... if you want to go the auction route yeah. or vault yeah, yeah i mean that's an auction route. route and i know yeah. that there's some other consignment services i just don't have any experience so i don't know how to make a recommendation you know I what i what obviously saying. i think um i think in our discord actually we have a lot of users that use consignments being like their local card shops they probably have a lot better opinion sure. on this than we do and then that was going to be my recommendation is just to reach out whether through a Discord like ours or if you're in a Facebook group or yeah. on Instagram, kind of solicit people's feedback and you'll get not only options for you, but you'll get kind of reviews and testimonials from people as well. All right, next question. Instagram, hockey card and nostalgia. Okay, so much annual hobby focus is placed on rookies' potential 
and the resulting investment potential of their cards only going up, would you be able to take the rough cumulative value of one particular rookie class, say all 50 PSA 10 young guns from that year, compare them from a one month after release, one year after release, three years after release, five years after release, and 10 years after, while the hobby focuses on value of proven prospects going up, 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 I would like to see a look at the bigger picture as opposed to individual high sales when a rookie class is just coming out for a lot of players. Is it the hottest it'll ever be? He says this question isn't meant to be a criticism of the show, but just hope collectors can step outside the hype and recognize that a card's value can't go up forever. Thanks, guys. Keep up the great work. So really great question. Interesting point. I totally kind of get your logic where you're coming from, but honestly, to do that, what you're suggesting for 50 young MPSA 10s would probably take about 20 hours. And and so I don't have the time, number one. And secondly, I think we already know the answer. Yeah, and, and to go back you, 10 years, you, yeah. then you have like, you have the hobby was in a different place. The the 2013 Young Guns was so small of a print class that I, I'm just not sure that you would get the answer you're looking for. But I understand the spirit of what you're talking about. And it's very, it's spot on, is that we get swept up in these prospects and we continuously lose sight of the fact that over the long haul, when it comes to, we talked about it with Ovechkin and Crosby. When it comes to lasting value, there's only four players that you can at least make a strong case right now that will have lasting hobby values where you could assume 10 years from now that their cards still could go up. That would be Crosby, Ovechkin, McDavid, and maybe Matthews. And then sort of Jack Hughes, but I think it's still very much on the risky side of the spectrum there too because he's had a few good months. To this point, right? why do you hate? Why no do con- you? Why do you hate Connor Bedard? <laughs> Connor Bedard will will always go up no matter what he does. I'm just right. I'm just kidding. I apologize. <laughs> Hockey gods, please forgive. Me. So, we, yes, and, and this is going to be a great example of series two. You're going to have Bedard. You're going to have Fantilli, Leo Carlson, Pavel Mintukov. You're going to have yep. all these. A ton of guys are showing a lot of promise right now. You have Nyes, Luke Hughes. We're lucky if you get one long-term hobby relevant player once every five years, maybe once every seven years. And so it is a big risk if you're one of these people that are dropping five, six, seven thousand dollars on a big like one of one RPA or a cup RPA. Because at the end of the day, for 90, 19 out of 20 cases, five years from now, those values will be worth less. Now, maybe yeah. you're doing it because you're a huge fan of the team. You love the player. You want to PC him. You followed him through college or juniors and you just want the card. And Hey, I know it's five grand. It'll probably be worth 1500 bucks five years from now, but I'm okay with that. Awesome. Go get your card. I actually think we, I'm, we might want to flag this question just for a summer project or something. Maybe, maybe this is an off season thing. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. I think we already know the answer. So it might, I don't want to do a bunch of work for <laughs> already knowing the answer, but it'd be interesting. Yeah, it's really that value curve that we've talked a little yeah. bit about before that spikes right away and then goes down over time. And, then, yeah. you know, and then it becomes a can that player be an all time legendary player, yeah. which there's, again, very few. Next question, Discord JT Hockey. Would love to hear your thoughts on Tag's recent announcement. I've seen a mix of good and bad opinions online. I have mixed opinions, but I'm still a Tag fan and I'm hoping for them to become the hobby standard in the future. So both Troy and I were caught a little bit off guard on this question yeah. because we we're like, uh, what happened? Right? It's like, <laughs> you're like you live under a rock sometimes. And so I went and looked and it's, it seems like what they've done is they've introduced a new service level. So they still have their standard service level that grades cards on a thousand point scale that we're kind of like, because what tag has become, I think, known for. Yeah. That's super transparent. You see every little nit and gritty detail in your card. But they've been, and they're calling that tag S now. Yeah. Do you remember what the S stands for, or, or does it stand for anything? Or oh, I can't remember. But okay. tag S is now like the regular, or the the service yeah, the, we were used to, right? Yeah. And they've introduced a new service level called tag X, which is a little bit stripped down. Yeah. It's a ten point scale, and a lot cheaper, frankly, right? Because it's twelve dollars a card, which I which if I had to guess is this is a move to compete with like PSA and SGC, who are where there's uh, a lot of competition in the space of grading. There's a lot of price competition. Prices seem to be getting lower and lower. And 
from what you get with tag on that thousand point scale and all the detail that goes, and I'm sure the manual like checks and balances and all that, that goes mm-hmm. into it, that they probably just can't do it at $12. And so they wanted a little bit of a, like I said, a stripped down version at 10 point. I think you still get a dig report or some sort yep. of report that shows you yep. at least the areas of the card that maybe have issues. So you get, still a little bit more transparency than you would get with other grading card companies. But, but yeah, I think it's a move. I'm guessing I should say it's a move that enables them to compete at that cheaper Mm -hmm. level while still having a service at $25 for the thousand point grading Yeah, that, that you can still use in addition to that. I'm a big fan of the thousand point grading. I think it's what makes tag uh, different from all the competition. So if I'm grading with them, I'm probably going to pay the premium, but that, cause I want to get that level of detail, I guess, in the card. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see kind of what the hobby. And I think they yeah. did like a, a drop of that, that tag X, that newer $12 service yeah. level. And it sold out right away. So maybe the hobby was really excited about yeah. it. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Troy? No, I mean, I'm all for, like we said a hundred times, innovation, figuring out where you play around. Again, I've said this many times on this show, I get so confused with grading and where these companies go and their prices are always changing. So this is, again, another, they're adding another service. So again, inherently, I get a little nervous because I, I, I don't grade at all, basically, with car, a lot of cards. But I think I can follow the logic that they're doing. I can see what's going on online. It'll just, like you said, it is interesting that the drop sold out. So maybe there is a a, re, or a a demand for this product. So we'll see. Yeah. All right. Next question from Twitter or X. At some point, we just call it X, right? Yeah. I think you have to. I've seen I've seen some media, big media outlets now changing to that. Yeah. Uh, our good friend Sebastian Engelhardt, thank you again for those awesome mini jerseys you sent. He said, Josh and Troy, congratulations! You both been selected to create a brand new upper deck product with your perfect specifications. Please fill in the following. So I didn't know. This is a big honor. Troy. Sweet. Uh, this may might have been a, like in my junk mail or something because I, I <laughs> it, but very, very excited. So he says we should fill in the following. The set name, cards per pack, packs per box, autos per box, and one brand new insert. So I'll go first. You, you did go first. I failed miserably at any of this. this I hard. just have a, I have a general thought. <laughs> That's about all I have. So my set name try I'm calling legendary moments. How does that sit with you? I think I had to look up. I swear there was something called legendary moments, but I don't think I no, couldn't I find think... anything. I couldn't find anything. Copyright so trademark. You're good. You're good. Josh of cards, sure. <laughs> cards per pack, packs per box. It's a one pack box with eight cards. You get two autos per box. My one brand new insert is the oh, NHL nice. debut patch on one on one. This is a five hundred dollar box. Yeah, no, it's very expensive. <laughs> All game used materials and memorabilia. I like right, it. So the whole deal is the legendary moments from legendary games. Very, very high end. Um, sp- uh, I'm creating a box I can't afford. Yeah, so that's great. <laughs> you all enjoy it because I can't buy it. Uh, what, what's your idea? Well, I was like, I, I just failed. I got to this late. I, I would create something that's a sister product to SP Signature Edition Legends. I think they really hit something there. And I want to keep building on that momentum. And this is where like, well, maybe I, you put in, this is where you put in the young guns that never were. You kind of add those in. I don't know how many cards you get. I'm fine if it's a, a lot of cards like SP Signature Edition Legends with an auto or two. I just, I think there's just so much there with what they did with SP Signature Edition Legends that build off of that. I don't think, you don't need to have SP Signature Edition Legends again because I think that was like a kind of what they said is like a one-off, right? But it's like, let's yeah. build on that kind of where you hit with the nostalgia and everything. Because I, I got to believe that was a very successful product for them. Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, next question. Instagram, Alex Bogart 93 Which NHL player has the cleanest or most aesthetic autograph? And the one that just popped out to me is Sidney Crosby. And I'm not and the hugest what, Crosby guy. Yeah. or I very, very much appreciate him, but I'm not a collector. But every time I see his auto, I'm like, dang, that's a nice auto. I um, definitely, that was the first name that popped into mind. Gretzky's I've always liked. 
but I don't, I don't, I wasn't sure if you like wanted current NHL players or there's no way I'm going to ever know every auto <laughs> that's ever been done. There's one guy, I can't remember his name. Was it Sharon Govich that had, they were basically just loops, 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 loops. And it always, it was really an, an intriguing one to me. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember that one. I think that's, I, I might, I think I might have one. I have to look at my database, but I always thought that was kind of interesting, but yes, Crosby's, Always stood out. Oli Lesfa, or otherwise known as Mario Lemieux. <laughs> so that's a fun Lemieux. One. Yeah. yeah. Left side. <laughs> Facebook, Mike Iyer. What are your first thoughts on 2021-22 The Cup preview picks? Any insert you like better than 2020-21 or maybe a new insert that they added? Uh, we talked about this new product releases, yeah. so I'll just reiterate. Um, we kind of both like the Rivals dual mm-hmm. auto kind of ticket booklets idea. I think that was the one that resonated yep. the most with us moving on to facebook henry peters would 2021 22 upper deck ice rookie ice premieres not be considered a true rookie because it's not part of the base set if they don't have released an actual base rookie for that set would that leave the ice premieres as just an sp insert okay so i, I guess if you go off the strict definition of what a true rookie is that it has to be from the base set or a parallel of the base set, then you're probably right. It's probably not considered. Yeah, it's just the XR. This becomes the XR, whatever that I definition. Know. I know. I get um, so lost. And I struggle with this because I'm not a, like, in my the way I collect, yeah. I don't really care or make a big distinction between true rookie or rookie year XRC or whatever. The I just don't get that technical about it. Yeah. And so I'm not in tune what exactly qualifies versus what doesn't. In my mind, like a rookie is a rookie. <laughs> But maybe that makes me simplistic in how I go about it. Uh, I know others probably really disagree yeah. and would have a good point as to why, but um, it's just not something that matters that much to me. Yep, I'm 100% with you. I think it's probably just because I want to keep it simpler. And a rookie card to me is a rookie card. I don't care if it has these other designations or it's not the true rookie. I could give a rip. Henry Peters asked another question, which I, I think is a good one, too. <laughs> yeah, that's come up a little one. bit before. <laughs> yeah. Would all of Michael Bunting's quote unquote rookie cards not be considered as such? His young guns came out in 2021, 2020, 21. All of his other rookie stuff, like Future Watch Auto, came out in 2021, 22. Would those not be considered rookie cards since his young gun was the year before? So, how I would answer this, Henry, is if a card has young guns badging or rookie designation on it or is a Future Watch Auto, then in my mind, it's a rookie yeah. no matter what year it came out. And honestly, Troy, we I think we need to kind of make a note to ask somebody yep. in upper deck I think we're, I think the we story need to. of bunting was yep. because it is kind of weird how yep. it seems like there's been three years of Michael Bunting rookie cards. <laughs> and there's gotta be a, a fun story behind it that I would really like to know. Yeah, I agree with you. We need to we just need upper deck to give us what's going on with some of these guys and what their thoughts on it is. Okay, next question. Facebook Justin McCoy, who is the best Russian born player in the NHL and who is your top five Russian born all time? So I'll go first, right? I'm going to go with Ovi, best of all time. Very controversial pick, I know. And then the top five, which I had to think a little bit more about. So I went with number five is Evgeny Malkin, four, Pavel Bure, three, Pavel Datsuk, two, my guy Sergei Fedorov, which kind of is a nostalgic problem. Maybe some might argue that. And then, uh, of course, Ovi Ovechkin for number one. Uh, who, do, who do you have for your top five? So my top five with my number one, I, I'm going to say is the greatest NHL Russian-born player. I had Datsuk as five, Mogilny at number four, Fedorov at three, Malkin at two, Ovi at one. And then I really debated because I guess the question is top five Russian-born all time, but I didn't know if he meant top five NHL. I would have to put Tretriak somewhere on there if it's not yeah, NHL players. Yeah. I would put Tretriak in that list too, but I just stay stuck to the NHL. The next question I didn't even answer because it's a question that's <laughs> Troy. Nick Zimmerman from Facebook asks, what is the best goalie card or set ever? Okay, Troy, All right. hand it over right to you. Well, I did some work on this because I've you've been doing this show long enough. Some of these cards that I see have kind of stuck out to me. However, you got to remember, too, this is so personal preference. Like, these are guys that probably – some of them are going to be guys I watched that I like. Others are just from – doing the PWCC stuff or watching Josh with Jeremy, you pick up on some of these cards. So I will go through the best 
what I think are just, I'm not going to say the best goalie cards, just really great goalie cards. Like the pictures are awesome or just the story of them. So I'm going to start. And I don't think this is, yeah, this is probably in particular order. We'll say I'm going from whatever, eight to one. Is Least favorite to most favorite? Least favorite to most favorite, I guess, of my favorite ones. So the, start with the 1986 OPG Patrick Waugh, very iconic card. I love it. Mid 80s. I love the picture, the outfit. It's Waugh. Great card. Next one, 1982 OPG Mike Liute. I can't get over this picture because of that helmet, how it's <laughs> it just the mask is like incredible. The, yeah, the, the mask is oblong. He's got the brown it's like, pants. It's like a Star Wars, like Stormtrooper yeah. mask almost. Yep. And I love the brown waffle with the holes in it, the Northland stick. Great, great, great picture. Great wait, wait, I got I got one more comment on this. Yeah. Card. How big is that waffle blocker? The it looks huge, it? doesn't it? Yeah. Holy moly. Yep. Got to take up the net somehow because they, they're all their Like their equipment wasn't very big. Usually like the pads are actually those look pretty big, but their chest protectors were so narrow. Their block and their breezers were so narrow. Now the guys were the biggest things they could fit into. Um, so that was my second, or I don't know what we call it. Next one. This one I love Ken Dryden. I love this more for the player. I think it's a great card. Josh, I know it's just like your favorite set from a design perspective. I love the blocker again, the waffle. I love how there's like a piece of tape around it. I always thought that was kind of yeah. fun. It's a great picture. Cla- great goalie. Short career, but boy, did he make every moment of that career count. Yeah. This one to me is just, it's so iconic. 1980 OPG oh, John how about Davidson. That five hole Troy. Look at that. <laughs> and this dude is big. He was like 6'4, six, 6'3. Six, John Davis was a big guy. He's still, I mean, if you watch any, I, I don't know where he's, if he's doing Ranger broadcast now, he's a big dude. Um, he's a, that's yeah. like a pooping in the woods stand. There, <laughs> I know. Look at that. He's like squatting and look at, so he's a big dude. Look how much net. So the net's six feet, it's six by four, six feet tall. He's still got space about he's crouched down. I guess he thought it made him move quicker. Now I don't hey, really, if you're really listening love the, to the show. 1980 OPG John Davidson. You yeah. Look up you look it up. It's great. I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the design overall. I'm more of a fan of the picture. All right, this one, Josh, this one's fantastic. 1974, OPG, Gary Smith. You just don't get more 70s than this. Brown pads, brown waffle. Obviously, the Sherwood stick that just says woo because there's too much tape on it because he really liked to tape his stick. The glove and then the the perm, the 70s perm. It's just a great, great looking card. And I think, yeah, I love this card. I love the old Vancouver emblem on it. Was he a good goal? I don't know much about. I him. don't think so, and I think he played for a ton of teams. Like he never really stuck. I want to say he had like a he had a funny nickname. I think that was like suitcase Gary Smith or something because he was always going off to a different team. If I remember reading that right. Well, the photo, I agree, it's an amazing card. The photo, when I look at it, I see like I let cousin Nikki try on my goalie equipment, <laughs> yeah. and I took a picture of it. Yeah, that does it does give that vibe. It's fantastic. Uh, next one. We're going to have this guy's going to get two in a row. How awesome is this? 1994 upper deck, awesome. right? Yeah, Rick Taber. I mean, was it Taberacci? Taber. Yeah, I think it's Taberacci. But his players going in, he's jumping. It's just a great action shot. That's all it is. It looks fantastic. And then his second card, which is next on my list, was a 1990 upper deck, Rick Taberacci. Taberacci. Again, I actually love this that he's. He's laying out a St. Louis Blues player. Do you think they would put this in a set today with a goalie laying out a player? And then I love I these Vaughn. Well, I do. I love these Vaughn pads because I had the same exact ones. I remember the Vaughn stitching down the side. I think I had Vaughn. They used to brand them Vaughn USA or Vaughn Canada. I think I had Vaughn USA's, but I just, this card's great. Just laying a guy was, out. Was he known as like a real physical goalie? I, you know, I didn't really, rem- I, I don't remember him that much. I remember the card. I mean, because this was, these 1990 upper decks, I will always remember walking into our, we had a drugstore a block away from my house, Kenny's, Kenny's market. I remember walking in there and seeing these packs of cards. And I was like, Whoa, these are pretty high quality. And I, I would save up all my money to go get <laughs> packs of upper deck, either hockey or baseball. And this is where I remember pulling this or seeing this card. All right. Final two. 1953 Parker's Terry Sacha. This is just an awesome card. We've talked about it many times. We've done previous. Limbo on goalie. It. Yep. Just a great look, great looking card. A lot of history. And then obviously, this is gonna be my first. Most people knew it. 
1983 OPG Pally Lindbergh. It's my favorite hockey card of all time. I just, it's one of them to me, the most iconic pictures ever of a goalie on a hockey card. And then for goalie sets, for the insert sets, I have some, but I had to look up some because I, I know I don't know every goalie insert set, but I've always liked Fleer. These are the Fleer, if you're watching on YouTube, Fleer Netminders. I've always enjoyed. I thought they looked really nice, really clean, good pictures. And then I've always been a fan of like Pinnacle Masks cards, even though the goalie is not really in it. <laughs> it's his mask. But I think these are always fun and look great. Those and get then, pretty valuable too, don't they? Oh, yeah, I think so. And then Mass Men, I've always been a fan of. And then finally, these were, uh, I, I just came recently and found these leaf painted warriors. I think these look really nice. Anything that showcases the mat mask. And again, like Billy said on one of our interviews, this is really hard to do now because of copyrights around the artwork yeah. on mask. So you, it's going to be hard to get one of the, get a lot of these close in mask pictures anymore. So long you answer. You would think though that the NHL <laughs> would come up with some sort of rule that if you're going to, paint a helmet you have to that's going to be used in an nhl game you got to sign a release well yeah how does how does the if he's wearing it in the whatever in the base set like is it just because it's zoomed out it's not zoomed in it's not the the newspaper have to a royalty it's like yeah 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 it's yeah well that was amazing troy and what we've definitely (laughs) learned today is if you want troy to go off the rockers deep just ask him a goalie question (laughs) and you're gonna get a hell of an answer uh that's pretty awesome Facebook Ward Zaharia. Is it disappointing that cards don't have borders anymore? I think a number of cards kind of still have borders, like OPG, I believe, yeah. feels like they still have a border. Maybe OPG Platinum as well, too. I'm probably forgetting some other sets, and maybe they're not as like distinct as the border. But we have to remember, too, that like going back to the Pelly Lindbergh you just showed from 1983, yeah. the purpose of the border was to create a margin of error for the printing companies and the cutters to not cut the cards so that that they would have room to play with to yeah. not like interfere with the card itself. And I assume that cutting machines are better to this point where they don't need that. <laughs> are we sure about that? <laughs> yeah. Unless it's Hobie G play. <laughs> yeah, then, uh, then, the, then the cutting machines are very, very broken. Yeah. I, so, I, I, I don't know. Did you have, can you think of any more sets that, have very distinctive borders i, I don't like, i i see these questions and i get so frustrated i'm like i just i don't know it well enough i i borders are just a topic i doesn't really concern me i guess either way if they have them or don't i get that sometimes having color on the border it's really hard to get sometimes those have issues with the chipping and yeah. the color fading away what's kind of a cool part to me about this hobby is that after doing 138 of these shows and the hours and hours of research that goes into each one, how we're constantly just flummoxed in what we don't know. <laughs> so a lot, a lot going oh, on in this hobby. Yeah. Award uh, Zahari had another question is, do you believe 1979 OPG cards were cut with wires? A hundred percent. I believe. So. I do. And everyone that I've talked to has told me they were. So I hope they were. Yeah. I wonder, is there a conspiracy yeah, well, theory behind this question or what? Wouldn't that be news? Oh, well, that'd be that awesome. Facebook, Eric Herbal. What is your take on what Upper Deck is charging for 2023-24 Series 2? Well, Eric, we've talked a lot about it on our show. Uh, as a collector, I don't love it, and I worried that there's unintended negative consequences for not only collectors, but Upper Deck and the entire distribution channel, like LCS stores, that we're all going to pay as a result, and I feel like yep. we're seeing a little bit of that right now. And then just as an observer of the hobby, it's pretty fascinating on that and to see what's going to happen because I have no clue how to predict it. But I, the super like like emotional collector side of me, and I'm not sure this is a fair, but it's just how I feel, is that it feels in some ways like a punishment to all the collectors that have supported this hobby and are excited about this rookie. And it's like, oh, great. Now you're going to triple the what the yeah. boxes cost. And, and when I was thinking about this, I, again, I don't know how this distribution works, how the pricing set, if they can, if Upper Deck can up pricing as they go on this stuff with pre-orders and allocations. But I think at the end of the day, Upper Deck is going to get a lot of flack on stuff that maybe they shouldn't have. Does that make sound right? Like, I don't oh, think no, you're can... right. And there should be a clarification yeah. that we make because Upper Deck is not charging. 
Upper Deck charges their di- distribution partners a uh, what are they a wholesale price? Yeah, wholesale price, and then, and then they, they, so the markup the... is happening on the distribution end. But I do think I think everyone I and this is a completely I get it. Everyone's going to look at Upper Deck at the end of the day. Is how I think it's going to play out. And one hundred percent. And that's what it is, and it stinks. I really stink. It stinks that those boxes are three hundred bucks right now. It just, like you said, it's a kind of punch in the gut. Instagram Thorson Collectibles. Best time to buy Future Watch Auto. It seems like they start high then go down, but the FOMO, the fear of missing out. Oh, the FOMO. Oh, the FOMO. So I think you have to look at this two ways. For the out of nine nine ninety nine, like the base Future Watch autos, yep. you're hundred percent right. They normally spike right out of the gate, but then, you know, six months down the road, unless yep. the player completely goes off, they're a lot cheaper. And that's almost true with like Young Guns or any set. Is that you're gonna pay the most right away, and then it's no longer the shiny new object that has everybody's attention, and the prices go down. The flip side of that is I do think you can get deals right away on rarer parallels like future watch auto blacks or other cards that the hobby doesn't really know what to price at yeah. and some people get them and just want the quick win so i would look at it but but generally i would say six months after release is a good time to if you're a smart a savvy buyer and you can resist the fear of missing out yep. but that's a good time to to target but again it's not foolproof because in that six months a player could score 50 goals and uh, the prices can spike too. So it's, it's a, but I think over time you'll come out better kind of playing the odds that way. Agree. And I always, where I question on sometimes on future watch aisles, obviously you just wait. Usually you're going to make out better than paying right away. But if you're really into a player and you want that inscribed version, and we know those are what limited to 50. Is that right? Does that sound right? Those are the ones you might want. You might have to, the, the FOMO might get you. <laughs> You might, you might get it right away. Yeah, you might get it right away. That, that's another good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, JT Hockey from Discord. Just saw your post about the Makar Exquisite Rookie 101. So we did a first public sale. I think it was a Rookie Auto 101 that sold for 4000 US. And he asked, can you do a rundown of which sets have exquisite cards and rank their rarity, desirability? I think Ice, Black Diamond, the Cup, I'll have them. I have no clue what the difference between them is. So... Uh, great question, and totally understand the confusion around this JT. So what you have to understand is go back to, I think, start in answering this is look at the big picture. So contractually, the NHL and Upper Deck have an agreement that no set can be more exclusive or have a higher value than the cup. The cup is meant to be the creme de la creme, the cream yep. of the crop. They rise to the top. But when you look at the all-time highest selling cards, though, of any sport, one of the most valuable set brands in existence is Exquisite Collection. So here's a couple. We've given stats like this before, but just to reiterate, there's been, Troy, more than 15 sales of an Exquisite card that has sold for more than a million dollars. 15 times. In any sport, now, right? Every sport. Yeah, Not it, just they're hard. mainly LeBron James yeah. rookies, but but they're Exquisite cards. It's, yep. it's Exquisite Collection because Upper Deck had basketball rights in 2003. And it's not just LeBron, though, because there's been 177 individual sales of exquisite cards for more than a hundred thousand US dollars. So you just can't argue that exquisite is not one of the very top brands in all of sports cards. But then you have to go back to that agreement between Upper Deck and the NHL regarding the cup. That it and it presents a challenge then for Upper Deck to continue with that exquisite heritage, but it cannot be released as a standalone set because it technically is probably more valuable than the cup <laughs> so what upper deck has done is they've kind of taken the set and they've sprinkled in various levels of that set into different products so like in and i don't know the exact breakdown um and honestly didn't have time to dig through all the sets but i know like in black diamond you'll see maybe like some like numbered base cards and parallels or maybe a couple autos ice had the tribute rpas but the the biggest exquisite cards are in the cup. Mm-hmm. Like we've seen with limited logos and the exquisite rookie packed auto, which is numbered to the player's jersey number in that. I believe that's the one that is in, in that set. So hopefully that answers your uh, your question. Anything you can add to that that I've forgotten? No, you're, you're the, our exquisite guru. <laughs> I'm definitely not our exquisite guru. Uh, would recommend too, if you haven't 
listened to it, our, our interview with Carmen Chung, who created Exquisite. Yeah. It was pretty awesome. Uh, he's an amazing guy. Last question, Troy. Another one right for you from Discord. MKE Breaks. He says, question for Troy. If you didn't PC Pecorine, who would you and why? Mm, great question. So I do PC some other players. I'm not only Pekka exclusively. Um, I definitely don't collect them to the extent of Pekka. But again, I've mentioned Pelly Lindbergh. I'm always going to be a Pelly Lindbergh fan. Obviously, you didn't Can play I ask that you a long. question about him? Yeah. Would you... Is it that there just hardly is any options to collect his cards? And yeah, he doesn't have a lot of cards. And but you're asking why I collect them? Like, why did I like? No, no, like, like why oh. you don't collect them more? Because they're just it's yeah. Like and I, get, I'm like... very picky. Like, I'm I'm not a I'm not a completionist collector. I don't need every single card that's ever been produced of a guy PC. Yeah. I just want cards I like of that person, and I will go out of my way to find them. But yeah, with Pelly, it's just there's not a lot of cards of him, and you tend to see the same image over and over. And so that kind of gets disappointing again, Mike bossy. I've always liked, I have a small bossy collection, any North star or wild player, but if I had to like pick new players, maybe I would have went down the route of some of the goalies. I really loved watching in the eighties and I'm not opposed to collecting them. I just, I don't go out of my way, but I would think like Ron Hextall. I absolutely loved P Peters, Tom Barrasso, any of those eighties, early ninety goalies. They're right in my wheelhouse. I love them all. So that's why just nostalgia and being a kid and being a goalie. All right, man, we're done with the mailbag. Awesome right. questions. You, you made us work guys this one, but keep it up on to personal pickups and we're big fat yep. losers. Nothing. Because Zero. It's, it's so hard with this show and life and travel I and Thanksgiving. I can just sit here and pull up and... random cards that I've had sitting here forever. Like here, Pekka. And... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I want to try to carve out time to be a collector too, because uh, it stinks. It's not just having content for the show. It's like, hey, we actually like doing this too. So yeah. uh, hopefully next week will be a different story for next show. But that's it for Monday. If you like the episode, please leave a rating review on Apple, Spotify, whatever podcast app you listen to us on. If you love the show, you want to support us, you want to chat with us every day in the Hockey Cards Gong Show Discord server, please consider a $5 a month donation. Join our on a $199 support level tier on Patreon. Link is in the show description if you're listening to us on a podcast app or in the description in YouTube within our Instagram profile in our link tree or TikTok profile. You go to our website, hockeycardsgongshow.com. Click on the Become a Patron link or go to Patreon directly, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, and search for Hockey Cards Gong Show. We are on social media, so follow us on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. And Troy, the Hockey Cards Gong Show podcast is a production of Dollar Box Ventures, LLC. Have an awesome Cyber Monday, I guess. Maybe find some sweet deals out there, and we'll chat with you on Thursday.